Okay. I'd like to welcome everyone to this meeting of the Community Preservation Act Committee. I'll call it to order at 6.02 p.m. on Wednesday, November 10th, 2021. We are still meeting remotely at uh, the request of town council, I believe. Um, I'd first like to take attendance, formally make sure everyone can hear. So please sit, respond audibly when I call your name. Sam McLeod. Here. Andrew McDougall. Present. Tim Neal. Present. Katie Zobel. Present. Eddie Startup. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Uh, Sarah Isinger is not here, or at least not yet. Dave Williams will be absent. And I'm Sarah Marshall. Um, chairing. Okay, so let's see. We have no we have no minutes to review. That's partly my bad because Anna sent them to me like two minutes after the close I was meeting last week. Determined this time. Sarah. Maybe one, maybe one minute. <laughs> so I will send those out. Um, Andrew owes us minutes, I think. And I'm gonna encourage Sam who's taking them this week. I think that next week is the perfect opportunity for us to review them all. Okay, we have the public hearing, might take a long time, might not take a long time. Um, so uh, I'll send on on as immediately. And if Sam and Andrew, Andy can do their best to- I'll, I'll try to that. be as brief as I can be. Well, there's, there's terse and then there's cryptic. So try to, yeah. Um, I think you can distribute those directly to the entire committee if you want, including Sonia, but if you just want to send them to her, that's fine. Just ask her to distribute them. Okay. All right. Um, I, do we have any financial update? Uh, no, not at the moment. Okay. We haven't, haven't closed, closed down some more projects to... <laughs> Give us some more money, no? No, we're pre pretty solid there right now. Okay, all right. Um, in that case, we are way ahead of schedule. Uh, I don't know um, if the applicants for the high school track are in the audience yet? Or yeah. if some, yes? I'll move, I'll move to again. Okay, super. All right, so this, just to remind anyone who <laughs> else is listening, this is our final night of hearing uh, the questions and answers presentations with the applicants. Um, next week on Thursday, uh, November 18th, we'll have our public hearing. Hopefully we'll go over minutes. We'll talk about how the committee proceeds with its evaluation and then time permits, we're just gonna plunge right in, <laughs> okay? All right. Welcome, Doug Slaughter. Thank you for having me. Yes. So tell us about your track proposal. So um, I noticed we were in 15 minute blocks, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep things fairly short. I think there'll be a fair number of questions and, and uh, follow up to, to sort of presenting things to begin with. But the short story is, and, and some of you are well aware of this and others are, are less so, uh, a few years back, we did a master planning process in the town uh, relative to the uh, you know, recreational facilities throughout the downtown area, uh, many of which are owned by the town, but many are also owned by the regional schools. Um, and as a part of that, one of the pieces of that puzzle was uh, the, uh, you know, the replacement of the, uh, the current track that's at the high school on the, uh, on the uh, side of the building there. And, and so, Right. I mean, that project took a, a fair amount of time and, and uh, you know, we had come to you uh, relative to some, some monies for design work, which we got from you. Uh, Pelham also uh, contributed some, so thank you for that. Um, and then COVID hit. So uh, it's, it sort of put a wrench in the works. Unfortunately for us, that track has continued to deteriorate. And so it's, it's presently in really, really rough shape if any of you have been out there. And if not, hopefully you saw an opportunity to, or took an opportunity to look at the photos that we sent along uh, to show, show that um, we're really not in a place to allow for uh, home track meets. Um, and so we really need to take action relative to that, that, that facility. Um, ideally, you know, we would 
want to do it in concert with what's in that master plan process that happened in the downtown, the, the phase one, which reorients the track and puts a, a field in the center of it. Um, it actually, if, you know, if, if uh, we were in a perfect world would have, you know, seating and, you know, other amenities and that sort of thing. Um, I think the reality of where we sit at this point in time is such that we can't really uh, go to that scale on the project. Um, and so, you know, what I, what I put together for you and put into your packet uh, or into your into the proposal was just a, a, a project to resurface the track. Um, you know, we need to take that action, um, and it and it, you know, implies uh, you know not necessarily reorienting. Um, I'd love to. I think it's a you know a tremendous opportunity to to really, um, you know, make a significant impact on on those facilities you know, that are, that are available to the schools, but also available to the community at large. And so we, we'd like to reorient, but again, we, we, we just need to take action on that. Um, so as part of this, just to kind of broaden the picture a little bit of, of actions we're looking at here, um, one of the pieces back a couple of years ago, when the, before the pandemic hit, we were planning on doing a little bit of, of some additional preparatory work to get uh, some of the estimates that, that Weston and Sampson had had put together for that master plan, kind of narrow some of the the uh, the costs around some of the aspects of, of that, and you know, sort of reorienting the track, uh, different options for field within on the interior of that. Um, you know, we're part and parcel of that sort of initial uh, little bit of extra work we wanted Weston Sampson to do. Um, we're in the process of reengaging with him in that conversation, and hopefully, uh, in the next you know, four to eight weeks, we'll have some more detail about what, uh, you know, sort of their thoughts are on the on the particular costs of doing a, a, a fairly simplified or scaled back uh, version of, of that phase one as they put it in the master plan. So that provides a little context for what we're going here. Um, so just, you know, like I said, the track's in, in rough shape. We do need to resurface it. We, we feel, uh, you know, it is an eligible CPA cost. It is a community resource. Um, that we think is helpful, um, you know, to the community at large as well as to the regional schools. Um, and so we, we made an ask um, as far as how we came up with the size of the ask. Uh, you know, recently at Frontier High School, they redid their track um, and, and they needed to sort of, um, you know, underneath the, the sort of rubberized surface is a sort of blacktop. They, they redid that and then put the rubberized surface on it. It was about six hundred forty thousand dollars to do that, and that was just in place. And so we have some additional need to move some of the field events outside of the track to create, uh, you know, a safer environment for those, as well as uh, the added benefit is it adds some additional field space interior to the track. Um, and so that's why you know an estimate uh, of about eight hundred thousand was 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 where we you know, sort of placed the number for for this request. Um, so I think those are. The main things I want to mention, just to kind of bring up to speed, tell you the thinking we have, um, create you know some understanding around the urgency of why the ask and why we didn't necessarily explicitly talk orientation uh, in that in that so much. Um, uh, so I'll leave it there. I think you know uh, Mr. Zomex here, you know he and I have been working together and along with uh, Sean Mangano on the. Uh, of the you know the town's finance director to, to talk about this and to to engage with with Weston and Sampson about this larger sort of project and and the master plan a little bit and so I don't know if if Dave has anything he would like to add relative to this or or not I'll yield to him for the moment. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Dave, is there anything you want to add at this time? Um, I think you I think you led that working group. Is that right? Right, right. For those folks on the call who are relatively new to, to CPAC or, or to some of the recreation planning, we, we did do a very extensive uh, overall field plan. We, we uh, as, as Doug indicated, we, we brought in this uh, uh, well uh, reputable firm out of Boston, Weston and Sampson. We pulled together folks from uh, the schools, from planning, from DPW, uh, from the Amherst uh, Rec Commission, and we spent about a year looking at the core fields, those fields at the high school, community field, the middle school, and we actually included Wildwood because it's part of that uh, core uh, educational facilities um, uh, uh, grouping that we have in the in the center of town. And really what the, the conclusion of all that was, we need to invest in those core fields. 
Um, and, and those are the, the really the future of our recreational uh, foundation. And we need to uh, come up with a plan. So Weston and Sampson came up with that plan. It clearly was a was a was a was a, um, a vision, if you will, uh, probably a 15 year plan. But the first phase of that was to come up with a reorientation of the track uh, and to look at either a natural turf field in the middle of that track or an artificial uh, turf field in the middle of that track. And the reason for the reorientation of the track uh, is, is really multi-pronged. One is that uh, most uh, uh, tracks and more importantly fields, uh, athletic fields, uh, particularly in New England, will are facing north-south uh, so that uh, goaltenders and players are not looking into the sun at, at various times of the year. Um, but also the importance of, of reorienting that track, it gives us much more flexibility uh, with um, different field orientations um, to the west of the high school. Um, so I guess, Doug, I was hoping you could give a, the, the committee a little bit more, um, you know, we had talked with Sean about kind of some contingencies or some, some options. Um, yeah, you referenced that um, we're going to get some more information from Weston and Sampson. I believe they're actually going to be out on Tuesday of next week. Uh, looking at the fields again with us. And and I was kind of hoping you could give us, I, I realize, and I think everyone realizes the urgency of the track, but um, how can we help CPAC to understand our decision-making process here a little bit more? Once we have that information, uh, we hope to have, you know, a, a solid cost estimate as to what reorienting the track north and south would cost, and then what it would cost in association with a natural turf field in the middle or an artificial turf field in the in the center of the track. So um, can you give a little more information on, on how that might play out? Well, I think that, you know, uh, with that additional information, uh, you know, I think that 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 we can strategize what's the what's the next best steps for us as far as a, a, a more um, in intensive project. In other words, if we if we want to go with a reorientation, which I think is, you know, the, the difficulty with not reorienting the track is you sort of uh, set the the you know the uh, the orientation for a generation. It's going to be another 20, 25 years before we can come back to that. So either the master planning process would have to be re-envisioned around a different orientation, or um, you know, we we sort of uh, abandon a component of that and move on to some other aspects of it, um, which I, you know, personally would not like to see. I think there's, there's a lot of real uh, positives to that reorientation factor. Um, but I think the thing for us is, is you know, like, like I said, the urgency of the track surface is pretty critical. And so we, we you know, I, I know the superintendent is going to push me to move ahead uh, through a capital planning process, if not through a CPA process to, to get that track surface redone. Um, I, I certainly think that if, if the reorientation is the wiser choice, and I think given the size of, you know, once we get some more detail from Weston and Sampson, I think we'll we'll strategize on how best to approach that capital planning process, whether it be through the through the regional schools and and their capital planning process, maybe in concert with with working with the town. I, I think we'll we'll work with uh, uh, the finance director there at the town to see if, you know, depending. I I think that's the hard thing is the range of numbers we had previously in the master plan were were pretty broad. Uh, I think we're trying to narrow the scope of some of the stuff that we're looking to do there to, to make it a little more uh, of a constrained and, and focused uh, on the, the fundamental facilities themselves. Uh, some of the amenities would be, you know, something that we could we could do later. Um, uh, and, and the other piece is that, you know, the, the, there are aspects of that kind of a project uh, that wouldn't be CPA eligible. So, uh, there, so we're, you know, obviously can't come to, to CPA to ask for, for uh, seating relative to, to do a field, that sort of thing. But the, the track itself is, 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 uh, is an eligible cost. Um, and I think that, it, you know, if the CPA, given the timelines of when we might find out more information and how we might strategize that, that next step, I think, you know, if the CPA, you know, the, the, the design money that has been already uh, appropriated you know for this project was was related to a, a reorientation i think if if a similar can you know constraint uh you know would would give the the committee a greater sense of of uh, comfort relative to the projects you know that would be 
that would be fine. I think that, you know that it's fully understandable that you know if you're if you're thinking about a larger master plan and, and a commitment to that and, and using CPA dollars to help you know realize that plan and and wanting to move in that direction that 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 kind of contingency on a on an authorization like this would be understandable by us. I mean, there's there's no doubt that that we recognize that that reorientation is a is a you know the the larger big correct step to take. Um, it's just you know we're we're just up against it relative to our track at the current at the current moment. So that's why we've we've, we've got this uh, sort of before you at the moment uh, and in front of you at the moment. And I think the 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 other piece relative to capital planning around you know potentially a reorienting and 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 field work within that um, you know it's a, it's going to be a bigger project and and so you know we'll we'll have to uh, you know think about how best to 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 uh, try to fund that additional amount if if you know this could be funded by CPA how do we sort of get from there to you know the full project price and and still uh, not not break the bank in any, anybody's regard and, and what's there I mean I think that's the other question that comes up around doing things on the regional property is is uh, you know are there are there um, you know what burden does Amherst bear particularly it does reside inside the town limits and so it's available for use by Amherst residents much more readily than it is for you know other member towns of the region um, but nonetheless you know there's the students all get access to that and utilize it uh, both in, in physical education classes, uh, other events, and then obviously for athletics. So, you know, it's a pretty critical resource for us at the schools. Um, but I, but it's certainly just back to the, the contingency. I think that you know, if if that reorientation is is something that's pretty critically important to uh, to this group as far as thinking about that master planning process and the funding that's that's been uh designated so far that contingency is something that's uh you know an understandable constraint that 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 this committee might want to place on that um as you go through your process thank you thank you both of you um i see some hands up uh start with anna who will need to leave at seven by the way so let her andrew was first sorry if he, he... okay Hello, <laughs> You're I'm sure it's going to be oh, all right. Okay. I'm the chair. So, I'm calling on Anna. Thank you. Okay. So <laughs> my question is, you know, I'm not sure, Doug, if it's going to be for you or, or Dave or Sarah. So I'm going to just throw it out there. We've navigated a lot in the past around um, budget supplant. Supl sorry, I'm like losing my, my voice here. Um, but budget supplanting and how we're not allowed to do that. And so my question is, how are we, how is this not? Um, a budget supplanting measure uh and is what if we were to say yes we need to reorient it and go in that direction then it even seems more so like it would be um budget supplanting because that is a capital plan that has been in the works and so i guess sarah i i want to make sure that we're we're still in the clear here where we're not breaking that rule and i also am i'm not you know trying to send another eight hundred thousand dollar request for the school budget like that's not that budget does not need 800,000 more, more dollars asked from it. So I'm right. trying to Can figure I out. Think, how, yeah. How Can I, I'm sorry to cut you. <laughs> cut you so off. that's the whole uh, thing. I'm done. Yeah. Um, I think the short answer, is, Sonia will wave her hands if I'm wrong, is that no, it's not supplanting. It's only supplanting if you, if the schools, the school district, school committee, whoever has committed to the project. And then comes to us and asks for money to fund what they've already authorized. That is supplanting. Right now, it's a dream on paper. That's all. So a master plan is not, we're not saying that that, okay. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying. Sure. Andy. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Doug. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm following correctly. So right now, as is the 800,000 you're proposing would be to resurface in place the, the track. Yeah, that's that's the way in which I wrote the the um, the proposal to you all. You know, um, in in the fact that you know we just didn't know if we could move ahead with the other, and so I wanted to state sure. a, a reality as it exists in 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 the time frame when we were submitting proposals. Uh, understood. And then you had you had said that you would be willing to have a contingency in that if we said that we would we would grant those funds uh, only if it were. Uh, towards the reorientation. Just wanted to make sure I heard you correctly on that too. Uh, yes, I think that's it. I think that's an option that you can explore. I mean, you know, if you don't want to put the contingency, I'm certainly happy with that as well. I mean, I think that, you know, I understand that, that 
you know, the, the master planning process we did around those fields and in, included that reorientation. And so if you feel like that's a necessary constraint, I think that that's an understandable one. And, and so, um, you know, it, it may not be one we may be able to meet. You know, I think that, you know, we'll know better if we, we can or can't relative to sure. conversations we have with our, our folks at uh, West and Samson as we get more detail. Yeah, no, I think you summed it up well when you said it's, it's this will commit to a generation, right? So wherever it goes, it's there for the next 25 years. Um, the, Is that the, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, just real quick, you'd mentioned that, so right now that the high school cannot host home track meets? That's correct. And then, so I'm wondering just where are they, do, do they have any means um, through like, UMass or Amherst College to do any type of um, kind of local or is there essentially every meet is an away meet? Uh, my understanding is pretty much every meet's away game. I don't think that the difficulty is, you know, when we're in track season, so is UMass and so is Amherst College, um, you know, yep. so the, their, their freedom to uh, allow us to use it. And they have their, you know, intramurals and other things and, and other concerns. Um, you know, does that mean we never use facilities at those? No, absolutely not. We do ask those folks and, and sometimes have the opportunity to go over there. But but uh, largely we can't, uh, you know, and, and you know, there are some that would suggest it's, it's really getting to a point where even, you know, regular practices, we have to be very careful about, uh, you know, safety issues, you know. Injury, very yeah. good, thank you. Tim. Well, two of my questions were already answered, so thank you. Um, I did have a question about the 800, is that, uh, as I understand it, uh, since it's a regional, uh, a regional um, school request, do other towns in the region have to approve funds from their C CPAC committees? And if so, is the 800 the cost of the project or the 800 you're asking Amherst Town to contribute? So I'm not opposed. Personally, I think I could go to the other towns. I don't know whether there's, you know, uh, I, well, I, let me say it this way. Uh, when we were looking for design funds a few years ago, we went to all four towns. Uh, you know, the outbreak of the pandemic hit during the, during the process that they were going through. I actually wrote a memo to them to say, I fully understand if you want to pause on, on making a recommendation relative to our request for design funds. Um, when I put this particular proposal together, uh, I specifically uh, just ask Amherst at the moment, um, and I do think that you know the number of 800 is is one to sort of completely do that resurfacing, um, and it's, a, it's sort of a twofold piece, and and you know one is that uh, it's simpler, <laughs> uh, but it's also because the track you know sort of sits within the environs of, of Amherst proper, and and uh, you know it, it's uh, it's an available resource to the community you know, in Amherst uh, all the time and, and does get utilized you know, regularly. So it felt it was, a, you know, a, a not unreasonable ask to, to have Amherst fund the track. Uh, if we were to, um, you know, uh, if, you know, if, for example, you were to fund at a lower level, you know, and or would would want me to go and, and ask the CPA committees of Leverett, Shoots, Brain, Pelham, I, I would be happy to go to them and see. Um, you know, I think the, the design was, was, you know, more and less comfortable depending on which town I was in. Uh, and, and I think that uh, that would be true of an actual uh, construction piece as well. So I think that, you know, it's, it, 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 it is a bit of a, uh, a difficult read at this point to know how much they would be willing to commit to something that physically resides outside their town. I think the design, they felt like they could support uh, because it augments, you know, sort of the regional school uh, approach to it. Um, the construction is obviously a lot more expensive and, and, and a little trickier. So I think it's hard to tell, but, but, uh, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not, uh, opposed to, to going out to those committees, um, unless they've changed their process. I've got, they didn't really, the other communities deal with their application process kind of in December. Uh, so we've got a little, a little time there, I think in that regard. Um, but I don't anticipate the costs for just replacement to be wildly higher than the, the number that I, that I requested there. And, and actually I'm hoping it's, it's less. And, and that'll be another thing that, you know, Weston Sampson will, will hopefully uh, be able to refine for us a little more uh, professionally uh, as we go through the work with them. And uh, sorry, one final question. Uh, 
I, I'm a little more familiar with collegiate track than high school track. And that is uh, the old days of uh, Amherst College running a meet against Trinity College one-on-one -on -one is was gone years ago. And it's all now regional meets and they're big events at big venues. And I didn't know what the high school uh, component is. Do you have like one-on-one -on -one meets? And if so, how many are there? You said they're away. Or do you have regional meets where you all go to Worcester, say, and have 18 track teams all at the same time and wouldn't necessarily host at, a, of an event at Amherst, at the town of Amherst anyway? That's really the genesis of that question. Thank you. Yeah, I think that, you know, I don't know, to be honest, I don't know for sure if dual meets still occur, you know, where it's one one team against another. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think generally, you know, they're, they're probably three or four teams is, is more typical. Uh, I think it depends on on the facility. So, you know, if, if Northampton can can have a meet, uh, you know, they're, they're likely to invite as many as will fit reasonably well. And obviously, if you have a much larger track like a, you know, like at a, uh, you know, UMass or, or you know, some facility like that, then they might have a big uh, sort of district wide kind of meet. Most of those are more later in the season as they get to the, to the sort of uh, playoff structure. But I think, uh, I don't know for sure whether dual meets still exist or if they're usually more than that. I think typically they're more than that. Um, and that's also, you know, another piece to this uh, that is going to be an interesting question as we, as we get through it is that the current track design is, is, is not the one that's typically done. Typically, at this point, when you design a track, uh, the straightaway will have eight lanes instead of six. Um, I think we're a six-lane track all the way around, including the straightaway uh, for sprints. So a lot of times they'll go to, you know, for hosting those larger meets like that, they've, they've gone to uh, eight-lane straightaway uh, and a little, you know, a little different design. It's not a, a lot different than what we have. Um, uh, and, and I'm, you know, we'd have to look at our, our current footprint to see whether or not we could expand you know, to an eight-lane straightaway in, in, the, in the physical location where we are. Um, one other thing that crossed my mind I want to mention, one of the difficulties in that location currently is there's no, you know, sort of, uh, a, you know, ADA access uh, really to that facility. Um, so the, the ways in which people who have mobility issues can get to that uh, are, are really limited, if not completely impossible for, for some folks. So whether it's disorientation or a different orientation, uh, that'll be something that we'll be probably compelled to, to address uh, just so that there's some, some way for people who have mobility issues to access and observe uh, activities at that, at that facility. And, and so that'll be a, a, a bonus for us to get that uh, to a condition that's a little more uh, uh, available to more people. And that'll be, I think, helpful and, and a really good, you know, a nice feature of it. Um, but I did want to mention that because I hadn't before. Uh, thank you, Doug, for your uh, discussion on the subject. A um, couple of comments and then a question. I did, uh, first off, the, the track really is in bad shape. Uh, it's been in bad shape for a while. I walked around it. We used to have some soccer games there and, uh, a few years ago. Uh, and it is a shame that the kids in town aren't able to have some meets on their home turf. That's always a significant thing whether whatever the sport may be in some cases such as cross country it's a specific advantage although on track it's uh the fields are about the same um i did attend uh, a number of the uh, a few of the sessions that dave led and i'd like to thank dave again for initiating the concept of a master plan for the athletic fields uh, a number of years ago before covid um, it was a thorough process. I was impressed with the uh, mindset of trying to arrive at a long-term solution. Um, I subscribe to that concept uh, based on what I heard at those meetings and also currently because uh, I do think it's in the interest of the high school and, and for the community as a whole to really know where to, to plan right, measure twice, cut once, to know where we want to be uh, 15 years from now. And the concerns I, I have uh, relating to the track is if we, you know, completely resurface it at this point, it's not going to move. Uh, and it may impact the uh, capacity, whether or not we want to add a turf field. I personally am an advocate for that. I know 
people who coach that, that I'm a strong believer that the high school needs at one point in time one field that can be utilized in bad weather. And I would assume, and this is an assumption, this isn't based on Dave's uh, uh, meetings, that it would be surrounded by the track. That's usually the, the way those work. So my concerns relate to uh, fixing ourselves in place and not being able to then achieve what would be the desirable solution down the road. Uh, in that context, uh, a question that I have is, is there anything we can do in the near term to make that track usable short of total resurfacing? I know that these few, these tracks are very uh, specific in their materials. They're really quite nice. They're great for runners. And I know that the current one has pockmark holes throughout, uh, but I've seen in our town roads how the, uh, various DPW and other towns have been able to resurface the holes. Is there anything we could do in the short term to make this track usable uh, for the next couple of years with the mindset of then launching to the bigger long-term plan? I wish that were so. I think we're at a place now. I, yes, the tracks can be repaired and there, there are routine patching that it does happen to them. Um, I think at this point, we we've kind of exhausted that option. In other words, the ability to continue to patch and have them have those patches and sort of stay in place and hold up uh, for a period of time. Uh, my understanding, you know, is, is that we've, we've kind of exhausted that one pretty much as much as we can. In other words, um, uh, and so the, the any repairing that we do at this point is, is really a, a very short term and very expensive, you know, kind of thing to do for not much gain. Uh, so I think that, you know, we'd love to, um, we've been patching actually, you know, we're well past the sort of, you know, recommended, uh, useful life of the track. And we've been, been doing a number of patching for a number of years. Um, and I think if, if, if we really felt we could continue to do that, we would sort of, you know, be here at this point, I think we'd be taking a little broader, more, uh, you know, different approach. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that, you know, I think everyone involved would love to have it reoriented and because the, the options available to us uh, are so much uh, better uh, relative to that. I just think we're, you know, the, the idea of it um, going another year without beginning to, to, to get that work uh, done on that track is, is just one we can't, can't wait for. So that's, that's the hard part there. And I think that, um, you know, again, I think, you know, if, if there's any way possible, I think, you know, I'm committed to, to the, you know, the process of, of finding out that additional information and, and trying to strategize a way to, to get uh, a reorientation project done. I really think that's, you know, the right direction in so many ways. You know, I mean, I, I sort of sit in this role as a finance person. I've sat on the finance committee for the town of Amherst back in the day. And, and so I get the, the smart, the smart money is to reorient it. You know, that's the long-term smart solution. So, you know, we're going to look at that really closely and, and, and it, our, are, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can find a way to get to that kind of a solution because I think that that's uh, you know, best in so many ways, in so many ways. Um, so we're hopeful that there's, there's you know, some, uh, you know, as we get a little bit more information, we can kind of work in that direction. Um, so I'd, I'd love to see that as the, the solution we try to find. And, and, uh, and I think everybody would, I mean, I, I really do. I, I think that that would be a, uh, you know, the best outcome for us. Do we have any further information on that, Dave, perhaps? I think, I think we need to, Sam, I think, we, excuse me, everybody, I think we need to move on to the next, um, to the next presentation. Perhaps if there, are, I see there's some hands up, we could pass some additional questions on to, to Doug or to Dave. Maybe that's the way to deal with it, but um, we've already spent quite a bit of time on this one. I recognize it's important and big questions here. Um, Dave, is it critical? <laughs> so, so. I just want to say one thing, just um, the smartest solution is a turf field. That is the best, most economical um, solution long-term. So I just wanted to get that out there. I think we're saying once in a generation, I think I hear everything Doug's saying, we all agree, we've got to fix the track. But if we do this, if we do this today, we're we're not going to re we're never going to reorient the track in our generation, our lifetimes. The other thing is I think 
if we need to also look at the money that was also was was allocated for design because I think that was very specific to the reorientation plan. So I think CPAC, just a note to Sonia, I'm sure she's on top of that, that we need to look at that in the future to really say, what did that article say? And I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank uh, you. Can, yes, I, I, can would... I interrupt, Sarah? Yes. <laughs> I see that uh, Rupert Roy Clark is in the um, attendees. Is he part of the next? Um... If we could add Rupert, that'd be great. Okay. That's all I wanted to know. Thanks. Sorry, remind me of his role. He's the facilities director. Right. So he'll be helpful if, if there are questions I can't answer on the next topic. Oh, you're going to present um, yeah. Crocker Farm also. Okay. Correct. All right. So I would just ask committee members, if you have any more questions, why don't you just send them to Sonia to collect again? <laughs> Sonia doesn't mind. All right. So thanks, Doug and Dave. Why don't you go on then to the Crocker Farm playgrounds? Great. So I would so thank you for that discussion dialogue and and hopefully I've, I've you know painted the picture of where we're at on that and hopefully we'll be able to move ahead and and uh, but certainly respect the process and decisions you have to make. As far as Crocker Farm, um, so there's a, a playground that sits what I would say behind the school uh, that's primarily for the younger grades, kindergarten and first second grade. So there it's a little oriented to younger kids. Um, and it is in significant need of some some work uh, and and refurbishment. It's you know a lot of equipment's at end of useful life, um, and it's also difficult uh, location wise. It's you know it's the I don't know how familiar you are with Crocker Farm, but it sits uh, the building itself sits kind of to one side of the property as it begins to go from uh, a lower elevation up to to the sort of Shea Street elevation. So it, it's on a fairly uh, uh, I don't want to say steep, but but uh, sloped land, and and so there is a bit of a flat area in the back, uh, not a huge area, but it but it is you know flat enough that they put a playground in that space. But but at the same time, accessing that is is really quite difficult. So besides the just the need of of uh, you know replacing and uh, renovating that that space of you know that play space at the school. Um, Another critical piece, and, and this was cited in the in the ADA study that schools had done a couple of years ago, uh, you know, physical access to that location is is difficult, um, and and uh, you know the current uh, pathway that takes you there uh, is is not compliant with with the sort of grade and you know slope uh, requirements of of uh, ADA. Um, as a matter of fact, there's you know there is a uh, a play structure that has a ramp that that I mean, you know so as you go up the uh, the walk the pathway to the, the playground it leads onto a ramp into a play structure um but other than that if you had mobility issues you you don't have a hard surface on which to walk and access the play areas and and once you were to get onto the play structure um through that you know by taking that path and going onto that little ramped area there's a very limited amount of that play structure you can even access if you had any sort of mobility issues so it's really a, a, you know an a difficult play space uh, for anyone with any mobility issues, but certainly, um, you know, also is just in need of, of some, uh, some, some, uh, you know, some new equipment and some redesign. And so, you know, the, the thinking behind the ask is, is that we would like to, to, uh, to renovate that space in a, in a pretty significant way. Um, I think there are a number of, of options we could explore relative to its, its location, not moving it much, but moving a little bit uh, potentially changing landscape a little bit to make the uh, ADA compliance a little bit easier to accomplish, uh, and then of course you know equipment that that is is uh, uh, you know sort of up to date and and safe and and fully. And I don't mean to imply that the current equipment is not safe, but it is near its end you know end of life, and and certainly a lot of repair work is getting done to it to keep it as safe as we can. Um, but you know, some new equipment would be much more highly utilized by more and more students. And, and so uh, again, I think, you know, besides the school kids that are Amherst kids uh, using it every day when school's in session, all the other times of the year that, that kids might wanna play, this is another resource for the community to have uh, a space to, to be on and, and play. Um, so I think that, that uh, the other thing I would suggest is, you know, Crocker Farm, I mean, I know there's a school building project that's in, in place right now, uh, but Crocker Farm, that building and that, that area is, is gonna remain a, a, a critical
critical component of our, our elementary school. So that building's not going anywhere and its use is not going anywhere. So uh, some investments in some of its uh, facilities is, is a reasonable sort of thing to continue to do uh, as we move ahead. And, and so this is an opportunity to do that. And, and we appreciate you taking that thought uh, some time to think about it and, 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 uh, and to consider it as a, as a project. Um, one last thing I'll, I'll say is this. Um, we were, uh, uh, Rupert and myself were, were talking about this earlier today. The size of that play area is, is roughly, uh, and I do say roughly, uh, but similar size to what just went in at Kendrick Park. Um, and so, you know, if you're kind of doing comparables, I, I looked up the, the project cost there at Kendrick Park and between the, the uh, park grant, the PARC grant uh, and, and money that I believe you guys made available uh, it's almost you know, $659,000. Um, you know, there are different things uh, that need to be done at, at those two different locations. I mean, obviously at, at Kendrick, there was uh, some other aesthetics and, you know, picnic tables and you know, walkways and some of that sort of stuff. Uh, at this one, we'll, we'll be a little more focused on a, on a, uh, on a you know, ADA compliance sort of uh, work. And so we'll, you know, we'll orient and, and choose uh, things based on that. Um, but I did want to, you know, sort of, give that to you as a comparable, which is why, you know, when we, we requested the 500,000, that was kind of where that number came from is that it kind of fit in that way. Um, you know, playgrounds have gotten really expensive, but they also a lot more expectations of them than there were uh, a long time ago. So uh, hopefully that kind of frames a little bit of it. And so I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have relative to that project. Thank you. Um, Katie. Why don't you start us off? Yes. Oh, thank you, Sarah. And thank you um, for the presentations, Doug. I appreciate this. Um, I just, I, you answered it um, in terms of how you were sort of aiming your budget. That was helpful. Um, I participated in the um, fundraising for the last, for the playground that we're talking about here, which I can't believe it was that long ago. Um, so I'm just curious about other funding opportunities. You know, we don't have, you know, we're not gonna be able to fund all our projects to the full request level. Um, so I'm just wondering about scalability, where other funding might come from if we couldn't fund uh, it completely, if, if um, and sort of who's, the last time it was really seemed to be school driven. And so I'm just, you know, at, particularly at Crocker Farm. So I'm just wondering a little bit more about who, who else is involved in the planning of this. Well, I think we're fairly early on in that regard. Um, I do think that, you know, there are opportunities. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, I know that it, it you know, at the uh, Port River and Wildwood both over the years and Crocker Farm has done this as well. You know, there, there have been, uh, you know, a PGO, Parent Guardian Organization, uh, fundraising efforts relative to that. Um, and certainly those would be, you know, uh, an avenue we'd, we'd want to explore and see if the, if, if, the, uh, if the PGO was interested, and I think they probably would be. Uh, of, of uh, beginning to, you know, sort of help support the project and, and either augment what we can do, because obviously we can spend a lot more than, than $500,000 and buy more stuff, or, or just to uh, reduce the burden on, on CPA funds for that. And so, uh, and, and there are some grant funds out there in, in some other areas. I mean, you know, there are other organizations. I mean, some things are small, like I looked up today, Home Depot has small community grants. They're like $5,000. Well, it's still five thousand dollars, so we can we can definitely get into and start supporting those. I think a lot of those would be augmentative to uh, a primary funding source, which which would be the case. Uh, what you know, CPA would serve in that regard. Um, but I think again, you know, as with the previous project I was talking about, this one is is one that you know needs some action sooner than later, um, and we need to make that investment in 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 that play space for us. So you know, we'll we'll definitely want to. Uh, uh, explore any and all sources that we can to help augment the project, but I would want to, uh, in advance, presume we could raise two hundred thousand dollars or something like that. I wouldn't. I I just don't know. I mean, maybe we could, but I, I wouldn't want to presume that to begin with. Andy, thanks, Sarah. Thanks again for this presentation, Doug. Um, so just slight variation on Katie's question would be if if we can't give you enough and you can't find other additional sources, do you have a mechanism of phasing this? Um, either to cover the ADA first or the replacement equipment. Um, just wondering, um, could you still make something happen with less money? That's a great question. Um, I may lean on Mr. Roy Clark to, to provide some additional uh, support here. I, I think it would be a little difficult, um, but, but, uh, 
just given the size and, and nature of the location, um, it might be difficult to do it in phases. At the same time, I mean, I think the, you know, the another option we would explore, you know, uh, as far as local funding is also, you know, uh, potentially, you know, submitting it as a capital project, uh, you know, uh, through the regular town of Amherst capital project planning, um, you know, as, a, as another potential source. So, you know, I think that, you know, it's, it's um, you know, that would be the other sort of primary first option that would be available to us. But uh, I'll defer to Mr. Roy Clark and see if he has any thoughts about whether we could would section it into multiple stages or something like that. Hi, can you hear me? Excellent, excellent, it worked, I unmuted. This is a success. Um, so uh, um, one of the interesting problems with this particular site is the slope where it is. Uh, if we were able to accomplish a study with a long-term goal, um, that would make it possible potentially for us to do some of the accessible pathway work um, ahead of uh, redoing the playground. It's hard to imagine um, dealing with the playground surface and, and boundaries without dealing with the, uh, the, the, the devices that are there, the slides and, the, and all the various things that are there. Um, I think all of that would have to happen at once. But if, if we determine this is going to, it's where it is and it's going to stay there, it's conceivable that we could do some of the access work ahead of time. On the other hand, if we determine that it's really going to be the, we would get the best bang for the buck if we um, slid uh, closer to the, the access road on the back, um, then that makes the access, uh, you know, access work a little bit more challenging. Uh, hopefully that adds a little bit to the conversation. It does. Thank, thank you. you, Roy. Uh, Tim. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Doug. And and uh, Roy, I, I'm uh, a little confused in that I believe when I read the proposal, it was for two playgrounds, one, the kindergarten one right behind the school and the other sort of at the end of the parking lot. And the reason I asked that is uh, I went and visited all the projects we're considering and I went to Crocker Farm and rather than just snoop around, I knocked on the door and and asked to let them know that I was going to be there and so they wouldn't come out and arrest a 70 year old guy. <laughs> so, but the principal came out and gave me a tour and the first playground he went to was not the one we're talking about but the other one the under, the one at the end of the parking lot and he told me that was in not very good shape and we did eventually segue back to the kindergarten pay, playground but I didn't get the sense that that was as high a priority as the other one from the principal of the school so uh, that's where I have some confusion here. So now, now, that that now I'm more confused. Which playground have we been, have you been describing? What do you call the playground? Unless I'm mishearing you, Doug. Uh, so I, just... I, I think that, so the very first question, which is relative to the application, um, you know, I think at the, at the time of, of looking at, at, at uh, and filling out the application, uh, you know, what I hoped might be possible would be to do the, what's called the kindergarten playground, um, which sits behind the school. So if you're facing the front doors, it's, it's uh, on the opposite side of the building. Um, the playground space that's at kind of the end of the parking lot. So as you drive into Crocker Farm and you park your car and you keep going in that same direction, uh, which has a blacktop surface uh, next to the library and then uh, drops significantly down to a, a playing fields area, that playground space definitely needs some attention as well. Um, and we've been using some capital funds that we've gotten over the last few years to do small you know, sort of mitigating repairs to that. Um, but as we, you know, sort of I submitted the application and then, you know, have learned more about the cost of, of playgrounds a little more precisely than, since I you know, hit the submit button. Um, it's, it's unlikely that we would be able to have uh, that 500,000 would, would be such that we'd have very much or if anything left over to do any more work on that other one. I think that that's going to be a, an entirely separate project. So I, I think that was some wishful thinking on my part in that regard. Uh, so I think we're going to, you know, I think the, the way to think of it for yourselves is that it, it is really about that, that one that sits behind the building. Um, 
kind of the kindergarten around. playground. Yes. The kindergarten and, playground. Okay. The kindergarten playground, which is which That's is cool. behind the building and and <clears throat> uh, you know, the the closer in proximity to the preschool playground space, which is just off their classroom space, mm -hmm. uh, which which was a project done about five years ago. Can I just clarify, uh, Doug? Thank you. That's really helpful. Are are those the pictures? Are the pictures all from the playground that we are talking yes. about? The pictures in our packet. Yes. It seemed like they're all from the same one, so I just want to. They are. Thank they you. are. That is correct. Thank you. And sorry for speaking out of turn. No, that's fine. That's fine. Um. So, okay, so the one at the end of the parking lot that you're already doing some work on and not expecting to use CPAC money for, at least in this application, that's the kind of the upper grade playground or the main playground. I just want to be using the proper terms for these. Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. That's correct. Anybody else? Oh, uh, Roy, well, Roy has, go ahead. And then Tim again. Sorry. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, I would like to say we're not insensitive to the issues with the, the upper grade or main playground. Um, those are also um, uh, serious issues and old equipment that we really need to resolve. My feeling is rather than spreading ourselves too thin and trying to cover the entire area, I would much prefer to uh, focus on one playground at a time. Um, I think that makes the most sense in terms of uh, how we spend our money. Um, so um, I absolutely do believe that we will need to deal with the uh, the uh, main playgrounds uh, in a much more serious way. Um, I just don't see us doing it all at once. Tim? Uh, just a quick question. My recollection also was that the, kind the kindergarten playground that we are now talking about is not used. Is that correct? Uh, that was my impression from the principal that they don't use it right now because of some of the issues that we're talking about. Whereas the other playground, I did see some kids around, but I, I'm now I'm a little confused on that. So maybe someone could clarify us. If that would be helpful. Does anybody know? I don't know. Roy, yes, please. You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> All right, I was actually there today. There were kids up there playing. Um, I don't know if that was an unusual event, but um, yes, it's, it's it, today it was in use. Is it fair? I have not, I sad to say, I have not yet toured the playgrounds. I would assume that the kindergarten playground is smaller than the main playground. Is that because, okay. So whenever you get to that, that's even the bigger pile of money, bigger project. If the, same degree, if the same degree of work is needed. That's right. That, yeah. That okay. Right. Yeah, I, I think if you want to sort of get a sense of size for this, you know, I think, think you know, thinking about the Kendry Park, if you kind of go and look at that space, it's a, it's a pretty similar, you know, sort of size facility for play. That makes more thing. sense to me now. It's just kindergarten. Yeah. yeah. I saw another hand up, flash up, but uh, somebody took it down. Any more on this subject? Can we get the zip line put back up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, given the slope, yeah. it'd be great. Yeah. Fully agree. Right. Fully agree. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, then, I want to thank you, gentlemen, for coming this thank evening. You. Thank you so much. Answer all our questions. All right. Great. Thank you. Appreciate Good the night. time. I think Sonia sends you out of the meeting. But... Great. Thank you. Sure. Sarah, um, while we're in between, we lost Sam somehow. Uh, so I think you still have quorum when I leave, but I just wanted to confirm that with five, you're set. Five, we should be set. Yes, he emailed me earlier that he's got some new oh, right. okay. headset. And so if he had trouble, he'd log out and then come in again. I don't know, Sonia may have to look for him in the <coughs> attendees or promote him maybe. If he's not there, but I just wanted to confirm that. Okay. I, I will be leaving abruptly. Right. So I didn't want right. to. Right, thank you. Yeah, I don't, I don't see him. All right, so next we have Plum Brook, and I think Alan Snow is in the audience. So he's, he's in the meeting. Oh, okay, he's coming. 
it's materializing. Hi. Hi, we hear you. Welcome. I can hear you and see you. Oh, okay. I don't. We don't see you, but that's fine. If, if, <laughs> if that's fine, if that's on choice. On purpose. Okay. <laughs> All right, so are you presenting more than one pr project this evening or just the Plumbrook? Just the Plumbrook. This evening. Okay, all right. Um, well, take it away. All right. Tell us, um, tell us about this the terrible shape this field is in. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, as the application uh, states, the uh, uh, current irrigation system at uh, Plumbrook Recreation Area is, is not functioning uh, at all. Um, the well, which um, provides water to the irrigation system, uh, essentially has um, silted up and is no longer um, able to supply enough water to run the system. Well, it's approximately 50 feet deep. Um, and it's, uh, I misquoted uh, the diameter of the pipe there. It's, I think it's two and a half inch, not three inch um, well. But, so we can't get enough water. Um, the irrigation system was really um, designed uh, uh, <laughs> it wasn't really designed for commercial, serious commercial use, it, it seems to be. It's uh, just even when we have enough water going into the irrigation system, it just struggles to put enough water down quick enough so that you can water the root zone uh, soil profile deep enough. Um, as a result, um, the roots of the grass tend to stay very shallow mm. and it makes the grass dependent on frequent irrigation. Um, so our proposal is to, um, one way or the other, we need to drill a new well. Uh, we'd like to move the current position of the well uh, so that it's adjacent to the parking lot uh, at Plum Brook. Uh, it's, it's about a, um, it's a 200 move essentially from where it is right now, just down the street. Um, and then uh, drill a much deeper well that will be able to um, draw water um, in the uh, confined aquifer, uh, which will hopefully provide enough flow to run a water cannon, uh, which will allow us to put a lot of water on very quickly um, on the athletic fields there. So. Um, we currently use water cannons to water the um, turf at community field and sometimes we move it around to the athletic fields um, at the high school as well where we don't have irrigation. It's a very, a very uh, simple process. It's a very easy unit to maintain and it comes in and the time gets winterized and we put it in storage. Um, it's, a, it's a nice system and we're very familiar with it. You say something about the um, what needs. I mean, the, besides its inability to water the field, I gather the um, the subsurface sprinkler system is creating problems also for for play yes. and for maintenance. Correct. Yeah. So the, the the actual physical irrigation system that is installed in the ground, um, 135 irrigation heads. Um, uh, you know, irrigation systems require like that requires a significant amount of maintenance. Um, it's, it's a tough environment for anything to be. There's electrical components, there are valves, um, wear and tear, uh, people running on them, equipment driving on them. Um, so they need constant maintenance. And currently the system has been rather, um, has run rather well um, as far as not needing significant maintenance, but it has reached a point, uh, some. I'm not sure. I think it's 18 years that Plumbrook, um, since Plumbrook was built. Um, it, it's time for it to have a, a major overhaul and install new, new valves um, and update the technology of the irrigation system. We again thought it's the perfect time to change the system to something that is easy to maintain um, and will actually make maintenance of the field itself uh, much easier for us. Currently, uh, every spring, uh, or summer when we want to aerate 
the field or if we want to roll the field. Um, we have to turn on each zone, uh, wait for the sprinkler head to pop up, mark it with a big white circle, and do that 135 times. Um, and it literally takes a day uh, for uh, three people to do that. Um, so, and then we have to, as we're rolling or aerating, we have to make sure we don't run over those white circles. So it's, it has created a lot of maintenance, um, time for maintenance for us. Um, if we could abandon that system, remove the heads, remove the, the handles that are in the ground, uh, reduce the trip hazards, um, it will make maintenance for us much simpler. Great, thank you. Uh, so questions now, uh, Andy? And Sonia, are you keeping, excuse me, keeping an eye out for Sam if he's stuck in some other room? Okay, thank you. Sorry, Andy, go ahead. No, no problem at all. Thank you, uh, thank you, Sarah. Thanks for the presentation, Alec. A um, couple quick questions would be, um, one sort of the standard one we ask, like if, if you had to sort of phase this, could we take the, the pump that's currently used to irrigate the other fields and move it here? I, I, that's a great question. I, I do not believe so, but I know that for a fact. Um, the, the new REL will, and um, water cannon will require um, a stronger pump than what we have there right now. Um, which is sized for to feed the cistern in the ground at a, um, a slower rate than we would need to run a water cannon. I, I guess so. Just looking at the, the budget though, so the so installing the new well, the new pump, having the new pump would drive any water cannon. Is that correct? Or um, am I not correct on that? Yeah, so the new the the new so we have two pumps. We have a pump that pumps water out of the ground. And then we have a pump that pumps the water out of the cistern into the irrigation system or into the water cannon. Um, so are you talking about the well pump in that? I think, well, so I guess as I'm looking more closely at the budget, I see there's the pump and then there's uh, the cannon with the booster pump. Yes. And so I guess, does, the, does every cannon have a booster pump? In which case, again, could we just, if needed, um, you know, move that that existing cannon that we have across town, you know, if if uh, we didn't have enough funding to cover this full ask. Correct. That's a great question, and we could we could um, definitely move the water cannon um, from Community Field to Plum Brook. Okay, and then um, and apologies if I just misheard you on this, but. In terms of the existing irrigation, you said you'd like to just pull up those heads. Um, that's not part of this proposal, though, correct? Right, that would be done in house. Um, we okay. Would, we would do that, and we would backfill everything and seed over anything that was um, left a dirt spot. Perfect. Thank you. Katie, I thought I saw a hand. Did you have? No, I, I, I think that. Last part, maybe Alan, you answered. Um, thank you for the proposal and presentation. I, I just, it sounded when I, I thought of removing that whole irrigation system, it seemed like it would be not only, it would add some cost to it, but also the, the re um, doing of the fields would add cost, but that isn't part of this request. It doesn't look like. Correct. Um, you know, we, we would essentially be going out into the field fields and uh, unscrewing the heads that are there and backfilling a, uh, um, you know, like a spray can size hole. Uh, so you'd leave some, all the water yeah. lines in place. All the water lines would stay in place. I see. And, but you can still do the aerating over, they're deep enough that that's not a problem for rolling and aerating. And Cor correct, correct. And there, there, are, there will just be abandoned there in place and uh, never be used um, again. Um, I wondered about the, the, the existing well that is failing. You said it is, well, first of all, it's too narrow, I guess. Um, the flow rate's too small, but you said it's silted, it's silted up. Is that mm -hmm. an inevitable, it, does that just happen in wells? And is there a way to ream them out? And is that a maintenance issue or is something other than that? That's a great, great question. It's 
it does happen. Um, it happens mm -hmm. to all wells. Um, we have tried to frack that well. Um, mm -hmm. We did get a slight increase in flow, but um, it's just too far gone to um, try to get any more water out of it. So. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Anybody else? Any other questions? I will just ask if you if you know Alan. I'm, I mean, I'm from the Rec Commission. Maybe <laughs> I should know, but that's a very heavily used field. Am I right? That gets a lot of play by different groups. Correct. It gets a lot of um, a lot of a lot of uh, youth use that field. Um, there's some unofficial use by some out of town leagues that use that um, oh. occasionally. Uh -huh. But it does get used heavily when it's playable, um, mm -hmm. and it uh, it could be used even more um, if it, uh, it conditions improved. Right. I gather that in the springtime, though, it can be wet, and that's that's not something that the new irrigation system can fix. That's just Mother Nature and being in a swamp, basically. Right? Yeah. So that's well, I think um, it's part design. Mm -hmm. um, and removing, abandoning the existing irrigation system actually would allow us to um, install some um, silt sort of, um, I'm forgetting the name of the, the it's like a silt uh, filter sock. Um, like a berm, um, put a berm around the. Well, it actually slice it into the soil. So there'd be a little bit of oh. soil disturbance but we could actually slice into the soil using a machine, kind of sows it into the ground, and we would be able to draw water away from the field into the surrounding, um, into the surrounding area. Jason Scales, a uh, uh, town engineer, mm -hmm. has, a, has a plan, has been working on a plan for that. Um, and by banning the irrigation system, we could really improve pursue, the field. Pursue that, um, interesting. Drainage. Okay, that'd be great. All right, well, I last call for questions on Plumbrook. All right, I think we're set then. Thank you, Alan. All right, thank you for your time. Okay, good night. So I think Dave is back to tell us about Hickory Ridge or answer our questions. Is that right? That is right. Uh, I am back, but I would appreciate it if Sonia could bring Ben Brager, um, uh, one of our planners, into the into the call. What we are going to do, if, if it's OK with you, Sarah, um, Ben and I put together um, five or six slides for each of the proposals. So we'll, we'll, I know you're short on time, so we will be as efficient as possible and, and then open it up for questions. So. Um, Real quickly, I think we'll start with Hickory Ridge because that's what the agenda said was next. There's Ben uh, introducing yep. Ben Brager from the planning department. Ben has been working closely with me and our team on Hickory Ridge. Um, I just wanted to bring to the CPAC's attention that um, about a month ago or so, we held a series three uh, information sessions down at Hickory Ridge on a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and over 225 people attended. It was an, it was an excellent uh, couple of days. Uh, we learned a lot. We are beginning the planning process for Hickory. We hope to close on the property before the end of the year. Um, we want this to be as inclusive a process as possible. That's why we're taking our time. We think this will be about a, probably an eight to 12 month master planning process for the site. We're looking at dozens of ideas that have come from the community, from uh, nature trails, pollinator habitat, zip lines, dog parks, um, uh, affordable housing, uh, community gardens, connecting trails to the village center, all of these wonderful ideas. And we're beginning to process them on the town website. Uh, we have a, uh, a, a, a part of that website called Engage Amherst, and we've had over 100 comments on Engage Amherst. So with that, um, we will talk about our proposal for trail funding, and I'll turn it over to Ben, and he can run through five or six quick slides. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Dave, um, and hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm just going to share my screen quickly and um, run through these slides quickly. So um, 
we're talking about the Hickory Ridge uh, recreation facilities, um, our request for $150,000 for uh, trail and recreation uh, facilities at Hickory Ridge. So to do. So here's just a, a brief overview of kind of showing Hickory Ridge in context. It's in, you know, three quarters of the way down uh, in South Amherst, um, kind of in, on uh, West Pomeroy Lane. Here's the old uh, golf club and the schematic for the for the course here. Uh, it's no longer going to be used for golf. We know that for certain. Uh, golf is not viable there given the flooding that occurs at, at, uh, uh, with the Fort River. Here's just a little bit, bit more zoomed in. It shows uh, this 150 acre parcel kind of in context of the neighborhood. You have Orchard Valley to the south here. Sorry, it's a bit cut off. Uh, the Pomeroy Village Center with Mission Cantina, the Amherst Office Park, uh, El Comelito in this area, Crocker Farm um, to the east over here. And then uh, upon, on East Hadley Road, the Mill Valley Estates, the Boulders, um, the Brook, South Point, uh, this uh, dense uh, apartment complexes here uh, to the north. So um, Hickory Ridge has a lot to offer both for recreation, um, but also connectivity for the neighborhood in this area to really take what was a private golf club, you know, private property, exclusive, expensive, and make it a public asset that really brings people together, uh, stitches the neighborhoods together and is an incredible recreation asset for the town uh, with over a mile of the Fort River running through the, the area. Um, so I think Dave alluded to this a bit, but some of the goals um, that the town had in purchasing the property um, from the beginning were certainly the protection of vital natural resources. Much of uh, Hickory Ridge is uh, priority habitat uh, estimated by the state because of uh, wood turtles and uh, freshwater mussels. So there's um, some important habitat uh, that's protected through the purchase of this property. Uh, certainly passive recreation and walking trails uh, that, you know, that was already something that was happening at Hickory Ridge, uh, especially in the winter. It's been uh, used for cross country skiing, even while it was a golf course. And certainly that's an important need that people want uh, to continue. Um, I alluded to this earlier too, neighborhood connectivity um, bringing, bringing the community together with this shared asset and then potential development along the road frontage. And like Dave said, we're in the middle of this master planning process to really drill down some of the, the activities and land uses. But I think we can say with, with certainty that their walking trails will be a part of this project that, you know, um, this is kind of a, a map that shows the, the solar array, which, uh, is going to be installed in the, um, uh, coming, you know, two to one to three years, I imagine, one to two years. Um, and that's been already permitted. And this shows the existing trails. I can zoom in a little bit. The existing trail network is in gray here. These are the cart paths um, that have been, you know, it's kind of a mix of actual pavement and crushed stone. And then in certain areas, it's just been mowed um, out. Um, and then this is just a, a, a schematic kind of like concept plan of how we could begin to stitch those existing cart paths together to form a true net trail system, a trail network, if you will, um, that kind of can provide, you know, looping opportunities for very long hikes, but then also shorter walking opportunities and to really begin bringing um, community members, you know, access to the Village Center, um, you know, potentially connecting in with the Garris Trail at some point uh, that would involve a bridge. So uh, 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 probably a separate project, but um, you can begin to kind of see how these cart paths form the, the, the fabric that we can use to uh, bring in a whole trail system together. And just some images. These are the existing trail conditions, um, you know, a mix of again, crushed stone, actual pavement and then you can see nature is starting to take the course at, at uh take its course at um hickory ridge um with you know uh you know you can see the fairways as well starting to rewild if you will um vegetation starting to come up um and so i think with the recreation facilities and trails at hickory ridge what we're really trying to do is make an, an accessible trail system as much as possible um, all four seasons to activate them, um, 
especially with, you know, cross country skiing and snowshoeing already so popular here. Um, and then again, kind of a, a spectrum of materials from crushed stone to fully paved to actually just mowing out pathways where the grading is appropriate, um, such as this. Uh, and then finally, you know, this is going to be an important recreation asset with where people, a lot of people come and visit. So just having some simple amenities like benches, sitting areas, picnic tables, kiosks with information and maps uh, is an important kind of way to invite people in and give them a place to, to relax and settle, settle down. So those are kind of briefly kind of like the overarching, you know, design ideas we have um, and the rough like kind of trail system that we're imagining here. Um, and with that, uh, leave it open for questions and thank you for your time. Can I ask your, your proposal um, asks for funding uh, that would go to, a, I think it was a mile or a mile and a half of trails and also to kiosks and benches and stuff. So if you could go back to that, <clears throat> I know it's not set in stone trail map, like how much of that system there is a mile and a half or, or a mile as the case may, I forget which it is, maybe you could tell. About one mile. Your proposal says that the CPAC funds, CPA funds could fund one mile. Of Correct. Yeah, I mean, that, that. How much of what I'm looking at would be a mile? <laughs> yeah, no, that, I mean, I will say that that's an average of, um, you know, varying different trail mm -hmm. conditions because part of it might be, you know, crushed stone, other parts of it might just be mowed, mowed out of the uh, fairway. Um, so obviously a, a crushed stone path is going to be more expensive on a linear um, distance um, compared to just mowing. But I think our goal is to complete like a, a loop trail or just a major connector trail and not just kind of have, leave, you know, leave it ending in the middle of the fairway. So I, I think we were imagining like, the, like having trails kind of through the core of the, of the land would be our priority. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe leave some of these looping trails that are a bit out further out from the property and harder to maintain kind of in a more, you know, rugged state, if you will, maybe just mowed out once, once or twice a year, mm -hmm. but putting our, the most investment kind of in the center core of the property where the most people are going to visit. Sarah, if, if, if I could add, um, yeah, I, I think Ben is, is, is kind of spot on. There's so many opportunities out here, as, as those of you who maybe have been to the course know, some of the, some of the cart paths are paved. Uh, ben, maybe you could point out the, the one going to the west. So although we can't nail all of these answers down right now, um, we're also looking at ADA options. That trail going to the west is partially paved right now. It would need some patching and or improvement, but to actually do like, say a half mile uh, loop trail there or a half mile kind of cul-de-sac trail there that is fully ADA would be simply spectacular. I can't say how many times um, in my social circles I hear people uh, saying how wonderful the Conti Refuge trails are over in Hadley. And I've probably said to this group before, sometimes I get a little defensive when people say that, but here's an opportunity here that we can do something pretty special on this side of the, the uh, town line. And, and we think it's, it's really the potential for, as Ben said, some paved trails, some crushed stone trails, and then some trails that'll just be a little more natural, like a, like a farm road. Um, so I also I wanted can, to yeah. Yeah, go ahead. If, well, if I can maybe focus my question a little bit. I just don't have a sense of the scale. Like how many miles of trail are we looking at? So like is, is, there, is does a, if, if we find a mile be, of trail, is that only, like half of what you want or a third of what you would hope to do or? If, if all, of, again, some of these are in a condition where we don't have to do much improvement, but, but others we may want to make fully ADA or do crushed stone. Ben, what you're showing there as a hypothetical is is a couple of miles of trail easily. I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if that's that might be four or five miles of trails if you really look at it. Okay. Tim, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
I also note that um, I want to give credit to my mom who doesn't know oh, she yeah. in that slide. Oh. Waving <laughs> um, and there she is. Uh, yeah. there she is. <laughs> again, that trail is on conservation land at Applewood, and you can really note that that is ADA accessible. It's crushed stone. That's what we want to offer to some of the so, or offer at some of our conservation areas to make them more accessible for many more people. Thanks. Okay, Tim, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just gonna. Uh, I am a golfer, and I have golfed that site. Uh, several times or more than once. Um, my recollection is an 18 hole uh, round of golf, you walk about four miles roughly. So if you figure 18 holes in there, it gives you some sense. So I think the, four, the whole system appears to be like four-ish miles or so. Uh, I did not read the proposal talking about the one mile, but I think that's an interesting observation, but that would be one comment I, I'd make. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if there was a way to think um, strategically about the trails um, in terms of other um, objectives of, in terms of this site. Um, I was able to come to one of the sessions, Dave, and was really helpful to be there um, to walk around and talk to some of you. Um, is it, so here's my dream, you know, is it possible right now to work on a trail that would link some of these communities that is mentioned in the proposal, like East Hadley Road, you know, through to West Pomeroy? Um, I think that would be amazing. Um, if, if there was some, you know, it, it's the usual, you know, what's the biggest bang for your buck, you know, at this point that we could, that would really demonstrate the impact of our funding and, you know, the difference that it makes right away. The short, the short answer, Hedy, is absolutely. That's one of the number one goals of this project. And one of the reasons that we stepped in to try to buy the property is to connect the neighborhoods to the north, south, and east. There really isn't much to the west because the Hadley line is over there and, 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 and uh, wetlands. But um, absolutely, that is one of our goals. And in fact, uh, Ben and I have some meetings set up with some of the apartment co complex managers and owners in the in the coming weeks. Um, it's going to take a lot of negotiation and a lot of discussion with them. Um, but yeah, absolutely. We would love it. Our dream would be that people from Orchard Valley can walk all the way north, get on old, uh, get on East Adley Road and walk over or bike over to um, Golf Park to use the spray park. And, and likewise, we would love it if people from the north neighborhoods could get over to Mission Cantina or El Comolito or to visit a friend at some of the uh, apartments over in the village center or pick up a gallon of milk at the, um, at the convenience store. So that's absolutely. Thank you. Sam? Can you hear me? Yes. Disconnected for a while there to switch venues. Um, <laughs> thank you for talking about this. This is certainly uh, an exciting property uh, for Amherst to uh, be making plans for. It's really quite something. Um, at one of the prior meetings, Dave, I don't know if it was the last meeting or another one, you had referenced to, that we not get ahead of ourselves. And I thought you were referring to Hickory Ridge. Are there contingencies related to ownership or what the town can do related to the property? Um, it, you may have been speaking in the context of uh, housing and a different property, and I might have misheard you, but I thought you indicated that it's in status where we were not yet free to uh, to go forward. Am I incorrect? Um, I'm not sure I, I fully understand that, Sam, but we we hope to close i i'm pretty confident we'll close before the end of the calendar year 21. Okay. so once we close then we can really begin the planning process it can speed up we've already begun but it can speed up again we want to take our time we want to do this right but as ben said trail connectivity neighborhood connectivity is a central theme i don't think we're going to waver from that but whether we 
whether whether and how much affordable housing or whether we do a BMX uh, bike trail or whether we do somebody said, oh, we need another dog park there. And, you know, whether all of those kinds of things happen, I think we need to take our time, be deliberate. And that may take, you know, more than than 2022 to to come up with those plans. But trail connectivity and connecting neighborhoods, I think, as I mentioned in my previous uh, response, are central to the project. So I think those can get going. I did want to mention too that we've put in a proposal to the CDBG for CDBG funds because we think the trails are going to, you know, it is not um, easy to make some of these trails accessible to all. So, and we also have some bridge work out there to do. So we've put in one of the questions you always ask is, have you asked for funding from other sources? The answer is yes. And we'll also try for state and private funding. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Dave. Eddie, you have another question or is your hand still up? Okay, there goes the hand. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. That's all right. No Just problem. Still learning. <laughs> all right, that's all right. You might have another question. Um, so, am I right in thinking there's a faint purple line across from Crocker Farm, and that's an existing trail, right over there? You said you, right. you said the name of a trail. So, is there? A, I see a a, tra a dashed line from Hickory Ridge crossing the river. Is there a bridge there now? No. You're there is not a bridge there now. That's a that's a vision we have is to try to connect the Harold Garris Trail. Is that right, Ben? Is that uh, how, how, Howard Howard yeah, Garris never, Trail? Never heard of that one. Yeah. And, so and the kids could walk to school would be super. The kids could walk to school, or or classrooms could leave Crocker Farm and go over a bridge and be on this property. Okay. Uh. Anything else? I think not. Okay, thanks. Um, are you all, I assume you're then also <laughs> yeah. going to present the- uh, Yeah, we can leave and then you can invite us back in. No, uh, <laughs> you're both. Ben, are you all, are you staying for the trail improvements? I am, yes. Okay, yeah. all right, then why don't you just, unless I've missed a hand, seeing a hand up. Okay. Dave, you want, do you wanna give any intro? I think Ben's going to jump right into it. I'm sensitive to, to the time of the of the committee. Cool. All right. So thank you. So um, kind of think zooming out from Hickory Ridge for a second, um, the town uh, maintains a, an incredible amount of uh, trail mileage, acres of conservation areas, um, and kind of just different amounts of open space that um, we are all have also submitted a request to help with ongoing trail uh, construction and facilities uh, for the town. So here's just an overview of the Amherst trail system with a corresponding map, um, 80 miles of foot trails, you know, nearly 2000 acres of conservation land, um, 100 or so bridges, uh, thousands of feet of bog bridging. Um, and I think it's important to note that, you know, um, Amherst, the amount of open space and conservation land and trails in Amherst is a, is a major draw to, you know, bring people here. Uh, it adds a lot to the quality of life, uh, just to just to be able to access nature so easily and get out into into the woods or into these meadows that are maintained. So um, we, you know, I think in the town hall, we pride ourselves in the in the trail system and conservation areas we we have here. Um, and so, you know, I think the br bridges are, you know, probably one of the biggest, um, you know, cost, co most costly items that are contribute to the uh, trail network. And they're really important as making, you know, trails accessible to everyone. They come in a variety of forms. They're wooden, steel bridges, historic old bridges, uh, fog, uh, bog bridges that uh, you see on the top here. Um, and, you know, that's an important work that, you know, the town staff and the conservation department take on themselves often. Um, there's always up against the natural elements. That's probably the number one things that's uh, causing havoc on the, tra on the trail system, whether it's a, uh, a river flooding and overtopping a bridge or a tree falling on a shed at Puffer's Pond, as you see here, 
or um just you know rain rain and uh kind of just um different amounts of erosion and stuff like that so that's kind of what we're up against and here's just quickly i'm going to run through these kind of just to give you a snippet a snapshot of what what's been done in the past year or so for our uh, trail system and recreation facilities here's the parking kind of before and after at, at uh, stanley street with a new kiosk here um, here's the some trail work at the Sweet Alice Conservation Area to kind of manage this grade and do some wetland restoration work. Um, parking also at Sweet Alice, a new parking facility and a trail that go that leads from the parking area to the trail system. This is off of Bay Road in South Amherst. Um, an incredible amount of bog bridging and footbridges on the Robert Frost Trail. Um, which is, I think, is still an ongoing project to, to complete. Um, also some ongoing, and then this is a kind of like proposed work. So this is like some of the work that would be covered under the, uh, the CPA request that um, is kind of in the backlog of, of new construction that, that is um, needed to be done in the, in the next few years or next year or so. So the uh, more work at the Sweet Alice Conservation Area to replace culverts uh, and to propose and to install boardwalk and footbridge over the Plum Brook. Um, at the Plum Springs Conservation Area, I was told there's damage from beavers that needs to be right uh, repaired uh, from the trail net uh, on the trails themselves, as you can see here. And I apologize, some of the pictures turned out kind of fuzzy. Um, also at the Potic Conservation Area, um, more work on culverts and replacing a vehicle uh, crossing or, or replacing it with a vehicle crossing or a footbridge. Um, likewise, on the uh, KC trail, the Ken Cuddleback trail that runs through a great length of Amherst, um, dealing, fix, fixing or uh, replacing this uh, vehicle crossing bridge or finding an alternative, ac alternative access point. And then um, on the Dickinson trail uh, near Groff Park, kind of trying to figure out how to navigate uh, this area that's been flooded um, repeatedly. Mm. So I think that is it. And here's a picture of Amethyst Brook. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> so I think that's just kind of a, a, a snapshot of some of the projects that would be taken on uh, with the CPA grant um, mm -hmm. that we have to work on now. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I see Sam has a hand up. Uh, thank you for the uh, presentation, Ben. Uh, I read the proposal. I had a question. What kind of equipment uh, is rented in association with uh, the trail work? I saw that in the proposal it referenced would pay for materials and equipment rental for significant improvements. I'm curious what type of equipment uh, might be rented. And separately, uh, am I correct that this would be, uh, these funds would not be used for the Hickory Ridge as well? It would be entirely distinct? So yeah, thank you, Sam. Um, the answer to your question, uh, second question is, uh, yeah, these are totally distinct uh, requests and, and this funding would not be used at Hickory. Um, in terms of equipment, um, when possible, we try to uh, seek assistance from DPW. I must say that uh, with equipment rental, and they have been uh, helpful to us in the past. I can think of a project in um, in Orchard Valley where we had a dam uh, that needed repair, and they uh, helped us with crews and, and equipment. But oftentimes when we need to do work, which is during the short summer here in New England, they are busy doing work as well. So what we've what we've done in the past is rent equipment like, um, for instance, uh, uh, mini excavators are key. Um, you know, uh, um, they're functional, they're small, they can get down trails, they can get by wetlands. So getting uh, mini excavators with various attachments on them for, for instance, uh, leveling out an, an accessible trail or removing a tree that is too big for for uh, um, a trail crew to move or for uh, working on bridges and uh, excuse me moving material right at this moment ben mentioned that we are doing extensive uh, trail work along the 
um, Robert Frost Trail. We got a $30,000 grant from the state to do that. It's due by 1231. We've got to have all the work done. So it is, uh, we are going gangbusters out there. And um, we were lucky enough to borrow a gator from the Department of Conservation and Recreation to move materials. As you can imagine, moving all that pressure treated lumber out into the woods could be a mile out into the woods on the Robert Frost Trail. To do that by hand is a whole lot of work and not very efficient. So we, we have tractors, we have two small tractors. We have strong people, we have seasonal help uh, when we could afford it, and that's how we get it done. Thank you. The helicopter. Yeah. Um, this question occurs to me, maybe it's not directly applicable to the proposal, maybe. Um, is there, if one uh, is limited, um, if, uh, one can only use accessible trails for whatever reason. Is, does the town have a map? Is there something that indicates what trails or what portions of trails mm. are accessible? We should do a better job at that, Sarah. It's it's kind of on our list. Um, we have five parts of trails or, or full trails that are accessible, but we don't do a great job at promoting them. Um, we have one at Puffer's Pond. We want, have one at Larch Hill. And there's a couple of others, but yeah, we need to do a better job at promoting those trails. Absolutely. So promoting would be great, but let's say if I went to the town's website, would I could I find that information somewhere, or is it not even really findable? It's there, but it's a little buried. Our website needs updating. Where there's too much verbiage, uh, you know, they, they were written. We have extensive. Uh, pages on our conservation website, but really, as, as we all know, nobody wants to read that much information anymore. So we really need to redo those pages. It's there, but it's it's buried. It needs to be, uh, we need to do some cleaning out and, and extensive editing. Um, ben, if it would be helpful if you could go back to the bridge, the bridge image. I just wanted to share with folks, this is uh, the, the bridge, um, with the abutment that is falling in the Hop Brook, that one. So that looks very small and looks rather simple. So this is off the, um, uh, I believe it's the KC Trail off of Southeast Street, heads due east toward the Narwhatic Rail Trail. This is an old farm uh, bridge, which is desi was designed back in the day to carry farm equipment well, we have an obligation to maintain that um, because farmers have an easement over it. And that is the current condition of it. We are not allowing any farm equipment to go over it. It's covered with plywood. It's fine for walking over as a, you know, as a hiker, um, but the abutments are falling in. So between permitting and an actual fix, of this project, uh, of this uh, uh, fix of the abutments, um, we're probably looking, that's probably a $35,000 fix right there to replace that bridge. So we don't have a lot of those, but we have, you know, a couple dozen easily bridges of, of relatively the same size that we maintain and we, we piece together um, you know, private funding. The Kestrel Trust has been very supportive. They just, uh, uh, they just uh, awarded us $15,000 to replace some bridges in, in the Lawrence Swamp. So they're very generous and very helpful. But um, some of these bridges are big ticket items. They're not easy fixes. So thanks. Any other questions from the committee? I don't see any. So I think we can wrap it up then. Thank you both again for your time tonight. Thank you for having us. All right. So now we turn to the North Amherst Community Farm. And I see Bruce Colden. Welcome, Bruce. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Sarah. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Good. Uh, my, my name is Bruce Colden. I'm the president of the North Amherst Community Farm and the applicant here. Um, I, I don't see the, uh, well, I guess I can now because I've been elevated, to, but I would <laughs> imagine that, uh, Sarah, that uh, Barbara Partee, another board member is oh. present. 
and uh, uh, and and possibly uh, Dave Tepper and or John Gerber, who were both uh, compromised on the time. They may or may not be able to attend, but but both of those are interested. Dave being the farmer for Simple Gifts, our lessee farmer. Excuse um, me, Barbara Party is in the. It's uh, available, I think. She may or may not wish to be elevated. Oh. She'll, she'll ask a question okay. uh, or she'll indicate when okay. she's ready to ask. Right. Um, but the, our proposal is to uh, uh, essentially to create a pavilion on uh, the, uh, the highly desirable part of the farm where we have our festivals uh, and various other th things. Uh, the festivals can pull 1,500 people or more. Uh, and then we have other activities that are less spectacular, but uh, the site is spectacular. Um, and what's happened recently, I mean, recently meaning in the 50, 10, 15 years that the, the farm has existed uh, with the neighboring properties, our co-housing community, the parcel that's been built by uh, Laura Sayer and Michael Evans and um, cooperation with uh, uh, owners further afield. And, and uh, there's a, uh, a, a quite extensive uh, trail system that's grown up and uh, and will continue to grow. Um, people from Rolling Ridge now can find their way all across that area and into the Mill River Recreation Area. Wow! And uh, so this pavilion will serve uh, both the, uh, the 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 trail system as a as a rest stop or a picnic area, a place as well as uh, essentially a stage a. Uh, uh, a, 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 a focus for for the uh, uh, farm communities events up on that hill and if you've been there the view is not quite as spectacular as the view that's behind David right now but uh, but but glimpses of it over his uh, right shoulder is 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 what we see for the Berkshires it's a beautiful beautiful site so the um, the request essentially is to secure the uh, framing lumber to construct this pavilion. We have an old barn. The barn is, is uh, 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 been uh, a bane of our existence for the whole of the time. It's, uh, we've done a lot of restoration and, and so forth of other barns and particularly the farmhouse with this, because this committee has been very helpful on three or four previous occasions. Um, but the barn cannot be done in the same way. So what we've decided to do is to source, use it as a source for materials for this other project that we have long uh, aspired to create. Um, it's basically in the lease with uh, Simple Gifts. So it's something that's, that we've been thinking of for 10 years or more. Um, and we can secure this uh, framing timber from the barn if we can deconstruct it carefully rather than push it over with a bulldozer. And the funds are to take this barn down in a way that we can uh, salvage the lumber, the lumber, the the, uh, the the framing materials, and then build an equivalent uh, uh, timber uh, post and frame timber building smaller on the site where we really need the building, um, not where it is now. The building we have is is old, decrepit, and we can't find a use for it. The use now is to use the materials to build the building we really want where we want it. Um, if you will uh, support this request of us of ours, we will be able to have the specialist uh, uh, labor to take it down. We have a lot of volunteer labors, which we can then sort and, and, and do all of the rest of the work. Um, we will secure that labor just as we've done with the farmhouse. We, we've got 3000 hours of volunteer labor, semi-skilled volunteer labor over a year for that project. I expect we can do the same. Um, we will raise money through our, um, our farm community, as we have done previously, to secure the additional materials, not notably the roofing material and the flooring material, because this will be an open sided pavilion, no electricity, no mechanicals, no insulation, no windows, no doors. Uh, a roof and a floor is what we need. And we will successfully, as we have in the past, raise money to do that. So this will be a two to one match, more or less, if we value uh, labor the way I've uh, suggested. The, 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 this is an important request because it starts the process. If we can secure this timber, this lumber, we can build the building. 
um, if we uh, secure it, then we can gradually use that to uh, excite the community, to galvanize the commitments of volunteer labor. And then um, as we build an, uh, and have a, an old fashioned barn raising with God knows how many people and so forth, it I think will lead to a surge of excitement of God, we did it because the frame we will then own, we can build it. The, uh, the thing will be a, a practical reality um, and we will use that to uh, the excitement of that to raise the money we need to put the roof and the floor on. So I think it's, uh, we will be successful as we have in the past in garnering those matching commitments. Um, I think uh, it'll be a fabulous amenity. And um, I uh, don't think I need to say more at this point. Thank you. Are there questions from the committee? Thought I saw Sam. Yes. Uh, thank you, Bruce, for the presentation. And uh, I commend you for your organizing and uh, efforts. Uh, very impressive from my perspective looking in. Um, two questions for you. Um, how many approximate members are there of the farm community, Simple Gifts and North Amherst Community Farm? And once the pavilion's built, you reference that it's accessible for those walking. Do you envision it being, uh, for lack of a better term, rented or made available to non-farm members as well? Or would this just be more for um, trail walking, uh, farm events, et cetera? Um, first question, um, remind me again, Sam, sorry. Uh, how many members? Members, yes, that's right. Well, we have um, uh, about 700 uh, people who have made uh, uh, contributions to uh, the fundraising that we have done so far. Many of them have made multiple con contributions. So that's that's one number, 700. Um, when I uh, was building the farm, the, the volunteers, we had 52 or something like that, 52 people who volunteered. Some of them volunteered two or hundred hours and some of them volunteered for half a day. But those were 52 people that uh, showed up and 52 doesn't sound much, but in fact, it's huge. <laughs> uh, getting 52 people to come, particularly when it, the tally is 3,000. So that's another. Um, I don't know what the share uh, 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 of people, uh, the, the community supported agriculture shares, but those when uh, I last checked were in the 500 plus or minus vicinity. So that's another metric. So 700 people have written checks, multiple, 500 of purchase shares and 50 have actually showed up and uh, and built and there are many more who've come on other events earlier in the past so there's there's hundreds probably who've come and actually participated in work days but remember the farm the construction of the farmhouse was a, I'm talking 50 essentially skilled or semi-skilled people um, so uh, that's those are the first those are the metrics that stick uh, with me um, uh, as, uh, then, as far as the the use of uh, the access, the um, occasionally simple gifts who are the lessees have uh, uh, rented the festival hill to. Um, they did last year, for example. There was a bike, uh, a bunch of cyclists who were on a, a tour, and they wanted to have an event and you know, have their lunch or something. And we put up tents for them and and. Uh, and they came and used the farm. And then of course, because we did it for that, other people joined in and it turned out not just to be an event for dedicated for cyclists, it turned out to be an event for everybody. So in theory, yes, uh, it could be uh, a place that was, um, and it wouldn't be just a pavilion, it would be the site and Simple Gifts would manage that. But essentially it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a building that is freely available to all because the uh, terms of the lease uh, state that this is a public, these are public trails that go through this, this farm. So um, generally, I think you, the answer would be, it's free to folks who come and, uh, and 
occasionally, and uh, it may be, uh, the venue may be um, uh, rented out for some purpose or other. Uh, thank you. Uh, you must be quite a construction manager to manage 52 volunteers. Well, they weren't there all at once. Uh, typically, <laughs> we, had, we had, you know, eight no, to Nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless. I get things done, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can see. <laughs> so I, I have a question. Um, because frankly, I have, I have, I have some concerns that we're not, we're not going to work out in this meeting about eligibility, but I know, or at least in your proposal, you said, you, you know, you want $25,000 to dismantle and salvage timbers from the, from the barn. And then it would cost another 30,000, I think, actual purchases of materials to then construct or finish the pavilion. Well, yes. that's after we've Did got I, the frame up, yes. After, after okay, we, so the frame is up, right. So I'm wondering if if it is, if it works better for a CPA, could could we fund the fit the roof and the floor as opposed to the dismantling of the barn? And absolutely no. And the reason for the unequivocal answer to that is that we don't start until we can uh, secure the, the bound materials to build the frame. So we have to uh, fund a process that uh, takes that barn down in a way that uh, yields building materials rather than demolition materials. Right, but you're saying you can't raise funds to hire the master carpenter or whatever to take it down. Um, I've done, I, I, I didn't know much about fundraising six or eight years ago, and I've learned a lot. Um, mm -hmm. It has to do with the story, and it has to do with building momentum. It's very difficult to raise funds to start something by public uh, uh, subscription, so to speak. What draws people in is when things start happening, when excitement builds. So th this is what I guess you would call in development practice early money. Um, the early money is not something that is easy or it's, it's, it's difficult. It's extremely difficult. And I wouldn't know quite how to start yeah. um, securing funds to, uh, on, the, uh, on, on, on the arm waving that I would need to do to describe uh, the pavilion. I'd much rather um, be raising money when we've just succeed, successfully had a barn raising. I imagine the level of excitement that would attend to that would be extraordinary. Um, and so that's why I think we can get 30,000 at the end, whereas it would be quite difficult to do it at the beginning. Well, what, what if you could say to people, we've got $25,000 from CPA to finish a pavilion if we can raise the frame, is that? Uh, is that enough of a story? I am um, I, it, it would but help, but just... it's, uh, it's, um, there's no momentum there. I've got to, I've got to start that momentum and, mm -hmm. and showing that we, I can get people to come. The first task will be to get people to come to clean the building out. It's full of junk. We've got to get rid of that junk. Then I need to, uh, secure a small group of people who can take the siding boards off so we can salvage those. Then things will taking those siding boards off and there's a clean open space inside will be the first big kind of reveal. Then I think uh, if we can take the building down, then people begin to think, yes, we've got something happening here. We can join in. Um, so I, 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 I can only say that the way in which the CPA committee can be uh, an order of magnitude more valuable would be to put the first $25,000 in and not the last $25,000. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Hetty. Um, it's a very minor point, Bruce, but just hearing you describe that timeline and the sort of thinking that goes into each step is really helpful. And, you know, having helped along some of this from the position I have on the Historical Commission, I just think the more transparent that you can be about the story, the better, you know, um, as a simple gifts 
member myself you know i think i think it's just just hearing about it when you go there you know i park by that barn um just having been to the having been to one of the fall festivals in the on the hilltop there you know i think it's such an adorable sight and and yes. and one's one's encounter with amherst and with what's going on in that part of town is just so incredibly charming and captivating that that knowing that timeline and sharing that with the community not just with the membership or the the farm itself but with the town i think would 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 help a little bit perhaps in kind of figuring out you know which bit of you know what's the phasing here as we keep we keep <laughs> we keep asking that question but um so more information please <laughs> which is always well, good yeah, <laughs> when someone asks you that <laughs> um hopefully scott Nosbach is uh, uh watching this these events both the before the historical commission and here i always regard this type of event as a as a is, is a is a public a public uh, engagement opportunity. Uh, the next thing that happens is I we put together a, a news bullet and we have a regular Mailchimp uh, and there's uh, about 1,200 uh, people on that list. That's another list, I guess. Uh, uh, Sam, um, uh, sorry, yes, you 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 you've moved around on the screen. <laughs> um, so. Uh, we will put that uh, newsletter out saying what we're doing. And uh, I was waiting until we had uh, finished uh, our hearing with the, uh, basically with the Historic Commission. And uh, so that'll come shortly and we'll be building. But th thank you, Hedy. Yes, we'll be, uh, is, 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 I'll talk to anybody about this. Uh, I'm working, building some stuff out there on the farm and people walking by. And every time they do, we have a, you know, a 10 minute conversation. Uh, so I learned that Jim Lake from Rolling Ridge said that the trail that uh, was linked the, the farm to the Rolling Ridge, it said, was, he said that it, he said that it, it improved the standard of his living immeasurably. <laughs> He's delighted to be able to, um, you know, get out of Rolling Ridge and walk. So it's just people like that I'm running into all the time. And I, I talk, talk, talk. Dave? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I know you said there, obviously, these are the the first of these presentations and, and there'll be more discussion later. Um, I know we've worked, the town has worked creatively with Bruce and NACF in the, in the past. Um, I just want to put it out, I'm having my, um, from having done this for many years and seen many proposals, I'm having tr a little trouble getting my head around a couple of things. One is, what category is this being proposed under? And I think we need to do a little more research to see, is it an eligible use of CPA funds? I, I again, I, I, I read your proposal, Bruce. I, 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 I don't know, it's, it's under recreation, but I, I, I've never seen a proposal like this under recreation. So I think we have to look kind of statewide to see, have there been other similar proposals maybe you are, uh, uh, that have been funded by other communities and maybe you've already done that. Um, so, yeah, because I'm kind of thinking if this is fundable under CPAC, I wonder if, you know, again, not to throw, throw this in there, but I wonder if the performance shell on the town common wouldn't be CPA fund, uh, fundable. If one is, I would think the other is too. I, I don't know. Maybe maybe uh, communities have funded larger performance, but but it strikes me that this is kind of the same thing in a, a much smaller scale. But anyway, I don't know, Bruce. Have you done any research statewide to see if other communities have funded things like this? Well, I think the CPA funded the playground structure uh, at uh, Kendrick Place, didn't they? Uh, sorry, Kendrick Park. So I thought because I just I didn't even think I needed to. I thought it was clear. But um, how this is not like a playground. So I, didn't we fund the pavilion a, for Groff Park? Park? It's a, it's a pavilion it's a at Groff Park. Park. Oh, Groff Park. Groff Park. Groff Park. Yeah. yeah. It. I. I. I mean. I. I suppose mm -hmm. if. If you. I mean. I would have thought that. 
that a play structure or a structure, I mean, this is, this is a play structure for adults. I mean, uh, it <laughs> really is no difference in my view. I can't see, I, so it, it didn't occur to me, Dave, David, that this was, a, this was something I needed to do. Mm. Would it be for performances or, or is it really gatherings? Um, um, or, I mean, it, it, it's, it's really to, to give life to that, uh, that site that we have on the hill. Um, you know, every time we do something up there, we've got to put up a tent and uh, tents are difficult, particularly at this time or because you, not because you're getting them up. Okay. Getting them down is the problem because you have to take them down dry and fold mm -hmm. them up. And that is, tr that is really difficult. Having a pavilion up there that we don't have to take down, uh, or put up and take down. I mean, that's, that's, that's the, that's the, that was the beginning of this. That's what said, that's why we said 10 years ago, we need to have something up there so that we can do the kind of farm education. Uh, we can support the kind of recreational activities that are, that, 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 that yeah. people are dying yeah. to have up there. We just need, we need a structure and whether it's a play structure for a park or a pavilion for a, for a trail, um, I didn't see, uh, um, yeah. there no, was any no, I'm not questioning the need for it. I'm, I'm just, it's, it's a, it's a creative, it's a creative way to look at it. It's, it's a pavilion on private property. So that's, that's the difference between a pavilion at Guelph Park is clearly open to the public anytime. Is this going to be open to the public Anytime. I don't know. I just think we need to look at it. You know, we'll, we'll do yeah. some research with you. Yeah, well, it's, it's certainly open to the public anytime. It's it's not. I mean, it's not public. That's true. It's a trust owned uh, a piece of land, but it's it's, and, uh, and is, is, it's the is the structure going to be on the APR or is it off the APR? It'll be on the well, it'll be on the APR. That's that's one more thing I have to deal with, which is uh, negotiating that particular thing but the the sense that that one we have thought about and and, and the sense is that we can successfully uh, uh, that that can be successfully uh, uh, um, permitted by the uh, by the state okay great well thanks I see Sonia has has her hand up yeah I had um, a couple of the same concerns that David have um, one it's that it is on private property and the other part is this is to deconstruct a building, not construct a, a pavilion. So I know that's the ultimate goal at the end of this, but this money would be to take down the barn. Well, the money, I, I would prefer you think of it as this is the money that we purchased the, uh, the structural material for the pavilion. It's like any, uh, it, it, to the extent that that you know, we 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 cut we solve the problem that we just discussed. If if it's not eligible, then, but if it is, then uh, I would uh, ask that you think of this as a way of securing the, uh, the the frame materials for the building and and doing so very cheaply. It's the it's it's the most cost effective way of getting uh, the material. Um, that we need. It happens to solve another problem as well, but uh, it's essentially securing the uh, the uh, frame material. For a, How is it cost effective? I, I, I'm ignorant about building. I mean, um, rather well, than just ordering lumber and. That, well, it's it's <laughs> a pavilion. It's this. This is a, if we're going to build something up there, and it's going to be uh, um, left to, to, to survive. Uh, it's not going, it has to be something that can uh, um, endure with almost no maintenance. Uh, using the kind of materials the, that are in that barn, those chestnut beams, uh, some of which we've got uh, really, the, the, the stuff that hasn't already broken, um, we've got some really durable material there that we can use. And if we put a good roof on it with wide overhangs, that can be a building that will um, require almost no maintenance, and uh, because there'll, there'll, be no, it'll, there'll be no place where the water will collect, uh, it's open and, uh, and so forth. Um, but that material that we have down there is is the best material uh, to use to build this thing. So we're securing that material with this uh, application. Can I can I chime in here? Yeah. 
So um, one of the other concerns that I have is it's private, it's private property. So would we need, and I'm not sure I'm gonna do some research on this, whether we would need to have a restriction placed since it's not a public property to have this on. What sort of restrictions on you? What do you mean? Well, kind of like we have restrictions on, uh, or I don't know, help me out, Dave. What are the agreements that we have with uh, historic property? Yeah, that we, type we, of thing. Like a, and again, Bruce, we're just we're we're kind of free thinking here a little bit yes. based on the the uniqueness of this proposal. But normally, when private entities are granted CPA funds. Uh, they what comes with that is um, a, a, a permanent restriction of some sort. Now, the land that you're proposing this on already has an APR on it. Yeah. So that may be a way, not around that, but 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 that may be a solution to that. But for instance, when we grant money to, um, you know, a, a private entity in town to restore a church or a stained glass window. Uh, the, the public through the CPA legislation, it requires the town or, municipal or city to get a restriction on that property. Um, yeah. And that restriction can can uh, uh, discuss and, and re um, require, you know, uh, pub the public being able to use the, the thing, whatever you've restored or see it or something like that. So we can, Sonia's just bringing up a good point and, and putting that in the, in the hopper here and we can do some research on that too. I think that if the uh, I, uh, gate, uh, uh, something that if the word restriction means uh, access, I mean securing access easements or something like that, that would seem to be the the kind of uh, um, uh, concession or whatever word you might want to use that uh, that a private body like us could uh, give. And I think we I I can't speak for the board, uh, but I would expect that we would uh, uh, be quite persuadable to create the kind of access that would give the town the security that this was private in name only and that access uh, was not only guaranteed by the terms of the lease but because we can change the lease um, but if you wanted if we could create some way in which the town would be satisfied that this public access that we're saying this building is to, pro to provide that was secured by more than just the terms of our lease. I think that we, we should be uh, prepared to entertain that kind of uh, proposition. And we may want to jog our memories on, on, on what we did with the farmhouse as well. So we can, we yeah. can continue this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So are there any, so these are technical things we'll have to wrestle with. Um, another time, but are there more questions specifically about this pavilion? I have one. Am I right in thinking that you don't know how big it will be because you don't know what can be salvaged? Or do you have a, a kind of a, a hope think, or expectation of what? I think it would be about a thousand square feet, um, 30 by 30, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, I'm And, and uh, but essentially that's true, but I would be surprised if we couldn't uh, get something of that size out of a barn that's, um, well, 60, it's, it's three times that size. Or it would have fallen down by now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think that would be the scale that we would, anything bigger than that would, would start to be a tail wagging a dog up there. Right. Okay, well, I see no more hands. So thank you. Thank you, Bruce, for thank coming you all. this evening. Uh, thank you all for, for spending so much time Thanks on this. Thank you for questions. Thanks. Thank you, Bruce. Okay. Bye -bye. So lastly, I think we have the pickleball players. I was on mute. Hi, everyone. Hello. <laughs> like Joyce is getting on too. Okay. Yeah, and which Barbara are you? Well, you're not Barbara Bills. I know that. Are you Barbara? I'm Barbara Brown. Barbara Brown. Okay. Three. Okay. 
a lot of Barbara's here this evening. We're, I'm not sure Joyce is materializing. Here's Joyce. Hi, Joyce. <laughs> You're muted. Um, we're sorry to make you wait. <laughs> if you've been waiting a long time, we're a little behind. Actually, not as far behind as we could have been. So I'll say that in our defense. <laughs> but thank you for coming tonight. Uh, why don't you tell us about your proposal for the football course? Okay. Terrific. Um, I'm Joyce Hatch and Barbara Brown and I um, have joined forces here to uh, try to move in the direction of pickleball courts in, in um, the town of Amherst. I, I have a question first. I'm just curious if any of you have ever played pickleball. <laughs> no? Okay. There's no, no court. <laughs> Well, Barb and I brought some show and tell just um, thinking that that might be the case. And I just wanted to uh, point out mostly because it doesn't take a lot of gear to play pickleball. And a racket's about this size and the ball, the pickleball is that size. And it's um, like a wiffle ball. And you might have a hat or a visor and really good sneakers. And outside of that, you just need a court or three. <laughs> so um, I, I think I, I, one thing I wanted to point out with all the gear is that it's really a minimal investment for folks compared to golf or biking or a number, te even tennis. Um, you have to rent court time usually if you're indoor, but um, ra rackets are, Oh, you can get a good racket under $100. Wiffle balls, not expensive at all. So um, I thought I'd just tell you my experience because I think it's gotten, the, pick, the game of pickleball has gotten the, um, I've always thought it's for people who go to Florida in the winter, you know? And that's how I first discovered it. And I don't go, but a friend of mine who was a college roommate, um, she and her husband visited us about five years ago and had come back from Florida and she brought this net and some chalk. And she said, we're going to your, your town tennis court and I'm gonna show you this game. And it was fun, it was great. We got a couple other people together. I still thought, ah, it's for people who go to Florida. Even though five years ago, their town in Northampton, New Hampshire had pickleball courts because they would play in the summer when they came back. Anyway, I think it's really gotten um, uh, some momentum in the area because of Bay Road and indoor pickleball. And they've taken the tennis, um, Bay Road tennis, and uh, put lines on some of the tennis courts. You can fit two pickleball courts on one tennis court, one on either side, and then have additional nets that are a little bit smaller. And they, they do clinics starting a couple of years ago. They started some clinics and that's how I actually got involved locally. And I think a lot of people did because of that ability to play indoors. Um, one of the things that I really think is important, I don't know if Barb, if it's been as striking to you, but I noticed it's such a co-ed sport. In so many other sports, people can play co-ed tennis, but often it's women play with women for a lot of reasons. Men are so much stronger. And some, for some reason in pickleball, people just like to play co-ed, although sometimes the guys that are some really serious guys play with each other, but some really serious competitive women also play with, with at that level with them, co-ed. And it just strikes me how, how interesting that is and not that many sports are, are like that. So um, I don't know what else to tell you except there's beside exercise and people can play for many years. I know someone who's very competitive and she's 80 um, and plays with men. Some um, I, There's just this social aspect to it. And it's hard to describe if you haven't been in a place where people play in a group and it's not that serious. Most of the time there's a lot of chatter because 
four people are playing on a relatively small space. And frankly, tennis players don't like to be in the vicinity of pickleball players because it's a little chatty and a little fun going on and noisy, so it's distracting. Um, and I think that's the case up at Bay Road in the winter too. So the tennis players like to get down the other end. Um, the, so it, why, why pickleball courts in Amherst? Well, we don't have any for one. Um, people, people go to other towns who, by the way, are using CPAC money for, for pickleball courts, Belchertown for one. Um, other towns are, if they haven't already done it, they're using that money. They're looking at additional courts or in the process, I know Northampton's in the process of looking at building um, courts with CPAC money. People play at Look Park. Uh, you pay to park and you pay to play. So that's not a public, but a lot of people from Amherst do go there. Um, not real pickleball courts, they're lime tennis courts, but that's another place. East Hampton has their own, a real pickleball court, Westfield. I, there's a long list. Um, but th what got me thinking about Amherst was I spoke to a pickleball friend that I hadn't seen for over a year. And I saw her this spring and she said, well, I've been playing all winter. I was like, really? I, you know, no one's been able to play at Bay Road. And she said, well, she and a couple of other people just, she lives in North Amherst. So she's an Amherst resident. She said, well, we just show up, bring our snow shovels and a, a broom. And, you know, if it's not too deep, we shovel it off. And if there's a nice sunny day, we play. So it's just that there's an enthusiasm that people have. Um, once you get hooked, it just uh, just keeps going. So with that in mind, I, I contacted Barb Bills when she was still in uh, the director and she suggested I go to a rec commission meeting. And I was interested in maybe having lines on the tennis courts at Mill River, thinking, you know, small, um, a start and, in some, some discussion that came out, some members, I think rightly so, said that the tennis courts, there are only two and they're busy and it would add to the competition for tennis. So maybe we should think about pickleball courts. And here we are. So Barb, I was talking to Barb and she is an avid player and uh, wanted to help out what she has. So that's where we are. Then um, we talked about a site and the rec commission suggested three possible sites. Um, not that there wouldn't be more, but maybe an elementary school, maybe um, War Memorial Park. There's an old basketball court there and Mill River. So Barb and I had our tape measures and we, we went to, um, we didn't go to the school. I, I sort of ruled the school out because there could be a conflict. Kids, uh, people play in the spring and the fall and students are there, parking's already taken up. So I, it didn't seem, and in the summer, um, there wouldn't be any uh, restroom facilities. So it just seemed like a recreation area would be the best fit. And War Memorial, the basketball court was just too small. You could probably fit one court, pickleball court, and then even then parking was an issue. It just, it didn't have any ambiance there <laughs> to speak of. And frankly, if we're gonna go through the, the effort and expense of building pickleball courts, it makes sense to do more than one because they're used in a way that more than one court is used at a time. Folks like to set a time, and gather as a group and mix them around with different courts, not just one court. So um, when we looked at the War Memorial, uh, the Mill River site, it just seemed, it just resonated. And the parking lot, I'm told, if you, I don't know if you saw, it's probably hard to see, but when you come in from 63 and the entry, and the entry road into Mill River, 
there's a parking lot on the left, sort of out of the way. And it just so happens to be the right size. And it's lined up north and south so that three courts could fit side by side, lined up north and south. And that's how courts are supposed to be sited. It's just, you know, it couldn't be any better. And, and in fact, Barbara and I were there and with tape measures and I had my compass on my cell phone and it was exactly north and south. It was just too good to be true. Um, another thing we did was have a contractor who's a, like an excavator who did a lot of the, did the excavation work for the Belchertown courts. And he came just to look at the site trying to get see if he could give us some kind of a rough estimate of what it would take to clear the asphalt and put cement down, which is what he did as part of his piece of the Belchertown courts. And his his assessment was it happened to be raining. We're there, you know, having raincoats on, we're meeting him. And he um he looked at it and he could tell that there it wasn't puddling, it was uh appropriate runoff and just flat. So it and packed down has been a parking lot. So it's rather packed. Um, it just seemed from a player point of view, it seemed perfect. Um, the other thing we did with putting together the proposal was there are two, two pieces to building a, a pickleball court we've learned. And one is the excavation and putting cement down. And then the other is the surfacing. And the kind of companies that do that are tennis court companies. And there's one out in the Berkshires, but the one uh, Vermont Tennis I contacted, they're the ones who also did uh, Belchertown courts. So that made sense just to contact them. So it was a rough, very, these are very rough estimates, but since um, the tennis, company does pickleball courts. I think they know what they're talking about. So um, I don't know if there are any questions. All I can say is for people, people over 55, and if you don't play tennis anymore, like me, although Barb still plays tennis, um, it's it's a just a natural fit. And many people play who played racquetball or ping pong. Seriously, one of the, a really good player. It was a ping pong player, but it it doesn't matter if people haven't even played a racket sport. It's it just um, it's something that once you do it and you have a little fun, you just you know it's easy to keep doing it. Yeah, Joyce, I would just add to that. I mean, I think it's uh, if you haven't gotten to read our letters of support, I hope you will because I think you can pretty quickly get the flavor of what we're saying about. People just get excited and people are playing with their grandkids. And I mean, it's really kids up and up through seniors, different, completely different physical abilities. People can still enjoy being out there. And, um, and you know, we had 20 residents right now willing to say how excited they are about the project. Um, they're either already playing or wanna play. And I think it shows how quickly this really could grow and the facility would be used a lot. Thank you. Oh, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. Yes, let's uh, see if committee members have questions and Andy does. Um, <clears throat> thanks for the presentation. Uh, mine's a really sort of simple one, uh, which is it, it seems like a lot of things are working out for this in terms of the excitement of the sport and that it seems like it would fit. Um, I'm not sure how to say this, but just because it can fit, is the town supportive of taking this parking spaces and turning them over to pickleball courts? If you're asking us, I mean, I'll just say that, again, it was the rec commission that requested that Joyce consider that one of the spots. And we've talked a lot. I mean, again, you saw in letters, but um, Ray Harp and Bar Bills, you know, as rec department people who are I think very familiar with that rec area are very supportive of this, but I, I can just tell you what other people have said to us. Yeah, and I read that I read that in in your proposal too. Yeah, it's maybe a question, Dave. I see you have your hand up. Maybe you you could help answer. But that was the only question that I had. Um, again, thank you for the, the proposal. 
I would say Ray, Ray is the, he's the new director. Ray Harp is the director of Amherst Rec now and he's in the audience, I believe. So if the committee would like to ask him that. That's yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to get an answer. Okay, maybe Thanks. Sonia can bring <laughs> Ray in. And uh, Tim. <laughs> yeah, this is sort of a this is sort of a related question, and that is again new, being new to the committee. Uh, if the town wanted or someone wanted to put a tennis court somewhere, I guess I guess don't understand why private citizens or town citizens are requesting this as opposed to the town recreation department. Hmm. Uh, as a that's I guess my question. Well, I, it came to me before Ray was, even, hi Ray, was um, on board and I would say we, it never occurred to us and we were very enthusiastic, okay, back in the spring when Barb was still the director, I believe. Okay, I, I, Ray, yeah, so, I just, yeah, yeah, I mean, it will not, it will be a town, if it happens, it will be a town asset, the town will own it, the town will manage it, the town will manage the construction, it's okay. just, the idea, the idea is coming from. All right, all right. So it's not a group of private citizens and oh, requesting no. for private. It's a town. It just happened. The idea germinated through yes. a group of town citizens. Yes, okay. they they are doing the legwork to propose okay. this amenity for amenity for the town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's a good question, Tim. <laughs> the um. I think the, the answer is that the rec commission at that time, the, the sentiment was that if there was a lot of support from residents, that it may have more um, support from CPAC as opposed to just a, a department, a town department. Um, so we're happy to have, <laughs> have the town rec department be very, you know, involved. And I think this is the end of, um, well, I wouldn't say the end, but this is what our our role is, is just to say there are a lot of people in town. There's a lot of enthusiasm. We um, would love to see uh, the town do this and run and scheduled by the rec department. This is what we were looking for. It'd be great. Ray, do you want to speak to? You're muted. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I can just make it real quick and say that uh, we are brainstorming ways to program with the court. Like it, it would give us an opportunity to use for uh, uh, camps, clinics sort of stuff. It's down there in a spot that we know we have some engagement with community. Um, the schools teach pickleball as part of their, their uh, phys ed curriculum. And it is a pretty popular uh, a, a part of that curriculum at times. And we, you know, I, I did see it as an opportunity to reach into the schools and sort of engage the, the students there also. There are a lot of reasons why I was intrigued by it when it first came to my attention on day one or day two of my, of my time in the office over there. Um, I, I wouldn't want to steal the, the the, the light there, I think they've, they've got a pretty nice open run uh, set up over there, but we as the rec department could use that. We, we definitely could commit ourselves to using that and scheduling it and, and programming it, uh, using it for, for town purposes. Thank you. Oh, Sarah. Yes, George. Um, the, one, the one thing that Barb and I have talked about that would be nice is should this be funded and, and move along? And the D, I'm assuming the DPW would do the work and get the contracts and contractors, but um, we would volunteer. And I think it would be a good idea just to have a group that checks in and advises about pickleball courts. Um, and I say this because we played on some and the one in particular was the town court and everyone says, gee, there wasn't enough room when people are going back to play and to swing. And um, so it, it's just little things that if there, anyone who was heading that project just wanted um, an advice or a small group of volunteers just to check in and say, what do you think about this? Um, not to add any money to things, but just, you know, just to say this works, this doesn't work. Um, I think 
we'd be happy to do that. But that, that's the extent of our um, responsibility. This isn't our project. Uh, we just see it as something for the town. That would be terrific. Thank you. Dave? Sure, I'll be very quick. So, you know, this is a very exciting project. Um, I have to say I have a close friend of the family lives in Eastern Mass. Every time I see her, she's just talking pickleball. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, I get there's like pickleball fever out there. Um, just to clarify, I think something Andrew asked about earlier, and, and I think Sarah, you just clarified it moments ago, which, you know, this is not unlike some other projects we've seen uh, promoted through say, Amherst baseball improvements to baseball fields, et cetera. This would be, this would have to be a town project on town land. As, as uh, previous speakers said, it would be coordinated uh, through uh, DPW and working with, with Ray in, in, um, in the recreation department. Um, I guess my one piece of advice, because I'm always about options, is if the committee decided to fund this, I would not make your funding contingent upon the, the courts being at Mill River, just in case. I'm all about options. So, you know, if, if you fund, if you choose to fund this, just, you know, that's the preferred site, but just I'm always about what if, what if, what if drainage is not right there? We just improved the basketball courts, May, you know, so we'd want to pull in the town engineer uh, from DPW and, and maybe a planner to work with Ray and, and this wonderful volunteer group that is, is uh, 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 coming together around this proposal. So, um, you know, I grew up five minutes from that park. Uh, I'm one of the biggest Mill River supporters uh, ever. So um, I think this would be an intriguing proposal. So. Um, those are my my comments, and I kind of look forward to working with Ray and and uh, Barbara and Joyce and others who are who are supportive of this. And let's 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 see if the CPAC uh, uh, finds it uh, as compelling as as some of you do. So thanks, Sam. Uh, thank you, uh, Joyce and Barbara, for the presentation. Um, and I. Uh, Congratulations, Ray, on your relatively recent appointment. I'm glad to see someone uh, in the town uh, addressing those needs and glad to see you here. If I heard correctly from your response to Andy's question, uh, my surmise is that you think that a pickleball court is a better use of the space than what would currently be there at Mill River, uh, which is, I believe, parking. That's what I'm hearing. Um, and when I heard you describing the location, Joyce, uh, I heard you say that you came in off 63 and took a left. Mm -hmm. Now, I know there's a oh. parking, but I, my understanding is in the back right. Is that correct? It's go ahead, Sarah. I see you shaking nope. your head. <laughs> you go down, you go around, you go around the circle and you go over to right below the road, right below 63. Right by the basketball. It's that, but, well, it's. You're going to basically do a U-turn. It's that it's, bit of parking lot that nobody parks in. Yeah, uh, uh, I've parked there okay. by the basketball courts. <laughs> Thanks in the basketball there. courts is so. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. That's fine. I don't. Uh, I understand. Just, I don't know if you can see this, but. Um, yeah, I know where that is. Yeah, the, there's a there's still parking in between the basketball court and. Where I under, I understand, yeah. and I that clarifies what might have been a misunderstanding for me. And uh, Ray, thank you for confirming that you think it's a good use of the space. And you are the director of rec. And I assume that the rec commission uh, has also at least had some favorable comments on this based on Sarah's indication. So thank you all. I see no other hands. So last call for questions. I see none, so Andy, thank you. Andy, Andy, Andy. I was only gonna make a oh, comment sorry. that every time I go to Mill River, there's a group of like five guys sitting, they're like essentially tailgating in that spot. So hopefully there's somewhere else where they can go. Well, it needs some public outreach, you know, just to, <laughs> maybe they're waiting for pickleball courts. I don't know. So, all right. Well, thank you, Joyce and Barbara for coming tonight and waiting. <laughs> thank you.
Okay, okay thank you. Thank I know you. it's been a long night for you. Okay, good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Did Sarah depart? We, we lost Sarah. <laughs> well, uh, Sam, <laughs> we could wait a minute to see if she's back. But my understanding was I was disconnected for about 15 to 20 minutes. And I believe I missed the Plumbrook presentation. Am I correct that I missed it? <laughs> if, it that's the if that's We're the case, again. <laughs> if that's the case, I believe we've finished all six of the presentations. Yes. Sarah's back here if she wishes to engage. Um, she may not be. Tanya connected booted up. me. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, back over to you. I Sarah. told you I'm learning. Oh, yes. <laughs> that's right. I've had enough. I'm leaving. So now that I know I can do that, that's great. <laughs> You're talking too much. All right. Um, so now we're at the time for public comment. Is there anyone <laughs> else here? Bar bills, I don't, I guess, and Trent, who I believe is from uh, the Reminder newspaper. So probably just listening. Can they raise hands if they want to speak? Is there a way for them to do that? So yes. this is your chance if you want to say something. Seeing no hands, I uh, figure we have no public comment. So. The last item on our agenda, topics I did not reasonably anticipate. I have no such items. So we're done. I will just remind you that we meet. Oh, Sam. It's not an <laughs> item. It's, a, it's not an item. It's a request of Sonia before we depart, since the request was made by you that we get the minutes done in advance of next week's meeting. I'm going to need to depend upon the recording of this session to come up with abbreviated minutes because I missed a stretch. So I'm raising my hand to uh, ask Sonia if you're able to uh, get that uh, to us in a reasonably timely fashion, it would be helpful. Thank you. Or okay. Sam, if that's not possible, just indicate where you were absent and we'll fill, we'll fill it in. Well, I didn't take any notes. I just listened. It's possible. Oh, I'll get that to you tomorrow. I've got my new MO since the recording. I'm like, it's better than any notes I'm taking and I can, I can read them. <laughs> okay. Kind of high risk approach, but yeah. it, it's fine. It's fine. Um, and if minutes, if any minutes cannot be ready for next week, that we'll just deal with them the next time. Okay. So I'll see everybody. I hope next Thursday at six o'clock. All right. Can I can yep. I ask a technical question? Yes. Are we supposed to vote to adjourn? I've been told you never need to vote to adjourn, and you don't okay. even need to adjourn. You just okay. Good. Okay. So, but we're we're leaving at eight thirty nine. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good night. Good night.